In this video, we will be exploring the entire third tier of the largest unsolved mystery iceberg ever made. The full iceberg has over a thousand entries, and in this video, we will explore one of the most horrific and mysterious deaths and disappearances of a group in America, to the 200-year treasure hunt on a mysterious island in Canada involving huge names like President Roosevelt and cowboy actor John Wayne, to the gruesome and puzzling murders of an entire German family in the 90s. 1920s to one of the greatest online puzzles and cryptic tasks ever made, commissioned by who and for what purpose, still to this day nobody knows. These are just a few of the cases covered, and the rest range from missing persons to serial killers to unsolved murders, to hoaxes, cryptids, paradoxes, and much much more. This video is a supercut of every video I made in the third tier, and so it contains a ton of cases. I've removed all of the intros and outros for them, clean them all up a little bit, and with all that being said, please enjoy this supercut of the third tier of the Unsolved Mystery Iceberg. So without further ado, grab a drink, my choice today is chai tea, and join me as we explore the Unsolved Mystery Iceberg. So to start off tier 3, we have Fond My Mind. This is the nickname essentially, given to a song by an unknown artist in the 80s. This song circulated on many forums aiming to identify it, but nobody has so far. It sounds European, but apparently in the 80s and 90s, it was quite popular for Brazilian bands to fake being European in order to get more hits, as the European style was more popular in Brazil at the time. Some people say their parents recognize this band as being a tiny local band that they remember hearing like 40 years ago, but nothing has been confirmed. 144 Mysterious Flying Objects. This is a reference to a report by the Director of National Intelligence. In the report, it says that out of 144 flying objects spotted between 2004 and 2021, the US government can't explain 143 of them. That's like all except one, which was probably just a balloon or something. The report doesn't mention aliens or extraterrestrials or crafts, but out of the 143 that they can't explain, there's got to be at least like 20 alien crafts flying around. At least. Maybe 21. The 3X murders. On June 11, 1930, Joseph Mazinski and Catherine May were sitting together in a parked car in Queens, New York. A man approached the vehicle, shot Joseph dead, and handed Catherine a note. The instructions said not to open the note until the following day, and the man then walked Catherine to a nearby bus stop and left her there unharmed. She didn't report the murder straight away, but soon Joseph was found, and they contacted Catherine as her coat was in the car. She met with police and told them what happened, and gave gave them the note which she had received, which just read Joseph Mazinski 3X097. The police had no leads, but a few days later a letter was sent to a local newspaper. The writer of this letter claimed to be the killer, and said that Joseph was a rascal and a dirty little rat, and 14 more of his friends will soon join him. Just five days later another man was killed in very similar circumstances. Nick Sowley and Elizabeth Ring were sitting in a parked car in again Queens, New York. When a man approached the car and asked for Nick's driver's license, he then said, you're the guy we want all right, you're gonna get what Joe got. And he shot him dead. He then took Elizabeth to a bus stop, gave her a note, and then vanished. The next day, another newspaper received a letter saying that 13 more men and one woman will go. Four days after this, Joseph Mazinski's brother received a letter in which the writer threatened to kill him if he didn't return those papers. What those those papers were referring to, we don't know. Shortly after this, authorities received another letter saying that he, the killer, was an agent of the Red Diamond of Russia, and that Joseph and Nick were former agents in the same organization. He said that they had turned against the Red Diamond of Russia and stolen important documents when they left, but since they had now been returned, the mission has ended and there is no further cause of worry. 3X is no more. The killings stopped after this, but the letters continued continued, but police couldn't determine whether these were fake letters or if they were actually written by the original killer. Amber Hagerman. This was the sad case of a nine-year-old girl who was grabbed off her bike as she was kicking and screaming and thrown into the back of a black truck in the parking lot of an abandoned Wind dixie This was in 1996 and she was found dead just four days later in a creek four miles away. The only description of the man who did this was that he was either white or Hispanic. 
Hispanic in his 20s to 30s, under six foot tall with black or brown hair. And although there were over 7,000 leads, no one was charged or convicted. After this extremely heartbreaking event, Amber's mother worked day and night to build a system that was eventually called the Amber System, which stood for America's Missing Broadcast Emergency Response, and was made to rapidly alert first local and then national people, communities, and areas after a child goes missing. In 2020, the Amber Alert System reached its 1,000th child saved and continues to find missing children all over the country. So an absolutely awful case, but Amber's mum did do great work in helping to ensure that this sort of thing happens a lot less often. The Angel of the Meadow was a woman found in Angel Meadow, England, 2010. She was covered up by a blue carpet and had a broken neck and a fractured jaw. Judging by her clothes and how much the body had decomposed, investigators estimated her birth date to be somewhere in the 1950s, having been killed sometime in the 1970s or 80s, meaning she was under that blue carpet for 30 to 40 years before being found. She was never identified, so sadly the Angel of the Meadow remains a Jane Doe. The B1 Butcher was an unidentified serial killer, responsible for at least nine murders in Namibia, South Africa. This was between 2005 and 2007, and the killer got their name from the media due to all the bodies being found near the National B1 Road. And the butcher part of it was because the bodies were all found dismembered. Two of the five women killed could not be identified, and they were all found in garbage bags, one body part at a time. The bodies also showed signs of freezing, suggesting that the killer had used some sort of freezer or refrigeration, either before, during, or after killing these women. In 2007, a German citizen in Namibia was arrested under suspicion of assaulting a 29-year-old Namibian woman, and later he was accused of being the B1 butcher, but he was released after three years for a lack of evidence. And since then, no more bodies attributed to the B1 butcher have been found, and no one has been charged for the murders. The Backyardian's pilot is a reference to the lost pilot for the animated series for Nick Jr., the Backyardigans. The Backyardigans premiered in 2004, but this lost pilot was made in 2002. The animation was in a different style than what eventually became of the Backyardigans, and the plot of the pilot was apparently similar to a later episode, The Heart of the Jungle. But we only have a single second of the footage of the pilot available, as it was shown on a Nick Jr. advert for new up-and-coming shows. And so the rest of the pilot is, for now, lost media. The Badge Man is another suspicious figure that was present during the JFK assassination. His name comes from the reflection of something on his chest, which some people suggest may have been a badge of sorts, which has led people to think that he might have been dressed as a police officer. There are theories suggesting that he was a sniper, firing at the president from the grassy knoll, and other theories saying that the image isn't a person at all, but a trick of the light or a distorted coke bottle or something. The Warren Commission, which was responsible for investigating JFK's assassination, didn't find anything suspicious in the photograph, because of course they didn't. And the true nature of the badge man remains to this day a mystery. The Barber Paradox is a puzzle or question that puts forward the following scenario. By the given definition, this hypothetical barber is the one who shaves all those and those only who don't shave themselves. And the question is, does the barber barber shave himself. Any answer you give to this question will be a contradiction. If he does shave himself, then he is shaving someone who shaves themselves, which contradicts his definition. And if he doesn't shave himself, then he fits into the definition of ones he shaves, and so he must shave himself. It's a bit nonsensical and a little bit tricky, and as some have pointed out, it's kind of a loaded question, as you're assuming the existence of something or someone who can't logically even exist. So of course there will be a paradox, but that's logic for you. The Beaumont children were three kids, Jane, Anna, and Grant, Beaumont, who went missing in 1966 from the Glenelg Beach in southern Australia. The three kids, aged 9, 7, and 4, took a five-minute bus ride from their home to the nearby Glenelg Beach. This was in the morning, and when they hadn't returned home three hours later, their dad drove to the beach to look for them. When he couldn't find them, he called the police, and there was a massive search of the beach and the surrounding area done, but the kids weren't found. Their main 
suspect was an unidentified man whom people had seen speaking and playing with the children before they went missing. He was tanned, slim to athletic, and wearing swim trunks. Apparently, the three kids seemed to be having fun, so nobody at the beach really took any notice of it. The man then went off to change, came back, and him and the three children left together, never to be seen again. There were a bunch of different suspects, but one by one they were all ruled out, and the three kids and their abductor were never found. But this still remains an open case, and there still remains a million dollar reward for information leading to the solving of this case. Bible John was an unidentified serial killer responsible for murdering three women in 1968 and 9 Glasgow, Scotland. The victims were all young women with brown hair between the ages of 25 and 32, and he met all of his victims in the Barrowland Ballroom, which was a dance hall in the city. This was one of the largest, most extensive manhunts in all of Scottish history, and was the first time that the Scottish government allowed the publication of a drawing of someone suspected of murder. He was dubbed Bible John based on the fact that he repeatedly quoted from the Bible and condemned any sort of adultery while he was with his final victim. There were more than a hundred detectives working full-time on this case, and more than 5,000 potential suspects were interviewed at the time. The head detective of the case said in 1972, It is quite incredible that this man has eluded us. I am positive this man comes from Glasgow or nearby. He is between 25 and 30, between 5 foot 10 and 6 feet tall, has light red hair, good features, blue-gray eyes, and a smart modern appearance. I do not think he is a very religious man, but just has a normal intelligent working knowledge of the Bible, which he likes to air. There must be many people who know someone who looks like this artist's impression. But despite the massive search and investigation, Bible John was never found and to this day remains unidentified. Planets. Yes, I said planets. These are a hypothetical class of exoplanets that directly orbit black holes. Like planets, they have enough mass to force themselves into a round shape, and in 2019, astronomers showed that there is a safe zone around a supermassive black hole that could potentially harbor thousands of planets, all orbiting around it. Because this one is quite short, I'll just add that supermassive black holes is actually the technical name for the largest classification of black holes holes. And, in fact, most galaxies have a supermassive black hole at their center, which the entire galaxy is orbiting around. These black holes tend to be between a hundred thousand and a few billion times the mass of our sun. Terrifying. Bowtowns are fearsome critters from lumberjack folklore, which I didn't even know was a thing. They circulated in the early 1900s and are said to sleep at the bottom of lakes during the day, and during the night the creatures rise and look around for boats that aren't tied up, and they swallow the boats whole. They look like a long boat with flipper-like feet, and they have four ears, two for listening forward and two for listening backwards. It also has a huge alligator-like mouth, and I'm not gonna lie, this kind of reminds me of the beast from Father Ted. They say it's as big as four cats, and it's got a retractable leg so it can leap up at you better. It lights up at night. It's got four ears, two of them are for listening, and the other two are kind of backup ears. Its claws are as big as cups, and for some reason it's got a tremendous fear of stamps. It's got magnets on its tail, so as if you're made out of metal, it can attach itself to you. And instead of a mouth, it's got four arses. But boat towns will be boat towns. The Bouvet Island lifeboat. So Bouvet Island is one of the most remote, desolate places on the planet. Its nearest landmass is Antarctica, and it was first discovered in 1739. And it was then lost for 69 years due to one being misplaced on the map, and two being just incredibly difficult to find as it was. It is an incredibly cold and inhospitable place, and has thick sea mist and storms for roughly 300 days a year. Over the years, in the 1900s, there were more and more visits to the island, mainly from Norwegian and South African ships. One visit in 1964 took the South Africans to the island, and after waiting for three days for the whirlwinds to drop, they attempted to land their helicopter. But what they found offshore was baffling. A small abandoned lifeboat floating
floating around against the shore. There were no markings on the boat to identify it, and on the rocks only a few hundred yards away was a 44 gallon drum and a pair of oars. There were also pieces of wood and a copper flotation or buoyancy tank that had been opened up flat for some purpose. So naturally they thought someone has shipwrecked her, but after an extensive search, they found no human bodies or remains. The boat arrived sometime between the two visits of 1955 and 1964, and came from a larger fishing or sea boat, but that's all that they could determine. The fact that no bodies were found, and the fact that the boat wasn't taken up and used as shelter, goes toward the theory that the boat simply fell off a ship and washed up here, but the wood collection and the very basic camp found nearby goes completely against that theory. So there seems to be conflicting evidence no matter what side you take. Who owned the boat, where it came from, and what happened to the crew who had collected the wood and made the camp? We, to this day, have no idea. Brittany Phillips was an 18-year-old girl found dead in her apartment in Tulsa 2004. She was assaulted and then killed, and was found roughly three days later by police. After being called by a friend of Brittany, after she went to check on her and noticed something odd, she was buried on her 19th birthday, and sadly no one has been charged for her murder. But as with a surprising amount of these lately, just this year new evidence was uncovered, which may give a more accurate timeline of Brittany's final moments, and may hopefully bring us closer to finding out who killed her. The Cambrian explosion was a very mysterious time in Earth's history, where around 530 million years ago, there was a huge boom in the evolution and diversity of animals in a relatively short period of time. Before the Cambrian era, most organisms were simple. They were either single-celled or small multi-celled organisms. Practically all of the major animal phyla that all of our modern animals evolved from came from that one explosion in time. It was thought to have been caused by many factors, not just one, and these factors aren't exhaustive, but I'll go through some of the theories that have been floated around. A rising sea level. So it is thought that after a rise in the sea levels, it flooded many low areas of land and created a bunch of shallow seas, which, at least in today's world, are areas that are absolutely teeming with life. The flooding would have also helped shift around and release various nutrients, such as phosphate and calcium, which would have helped with growing hard shells in the evolving life forms. There was almost three times the amount of calcium after the start of the Cambrian period than before it, and because of this, it is thought that a arms race of sorts started between animals using the calcium defensively, like turtles, and animals using it offensively, or stuff like teeth or horns. This rapid back and forth competition may have led to several species evolving faster than they normally would, which catapulted the modern and rapid evolution of these animals. But the definitive cause for one of life's most important events has yet to be fully figured out. Cattle mutilation is the mutilation of no, but seriously, this is a phenomenon observed among both livestock and wild animals, where they are found with a removed body part, often an ear, eye, tongue, or genitalia, in an almost surgical, bloodless manner. This has been reported as far back as the 1600s, and there have been many theories about this one over the years. These range from predators to poachers, underground cults to secret government operations, and cryptid creatures such as the Truba cabra to aliens. And if you know me, you know where I stand on this one. Charlie Chopoff was the name given to an unidentified serial killer who killed four children in Manhattan between 1972 and 1973. He was named this because all of his victims were boys and they all had their, you know what, chopped off. Pretty gruesome stuff and this guy was an absolute monster and after a failed abduction of a boy in 1974, a man called Erno Soto was arrested by the police. He admitted to the killing of one of the boys, but none of the others. And his only surviving victim said that he looked like his attacker, but that he couldn't positively identify him. Erno was an intermittent patient at a Manhattan mental hospital and officials at the hospital said that Soto was under their 
custody during the times of the killings, but later admitted that he might have evaded their custody, as he had done so before. He was sent back to the mental hospital, and is still the investigator's main suspect, as the killings did stop when he was taken away, but due to him being in a mental hospital, it is thought that it is unlikely that he will stand trial for these killings. Chip Campbell. This was a case of a 36-year-old man who went missing in Florida 2016. He was caught on the security footage of a Circle K gas station and then never seen again. He had been battling with depression, loneliness, and addiction for most of his life and had a really rough upbringing in terms of people around him either abandoning him or dying when he apparently needed them the most. But he never took it out on anyone else. He was a gentle giant, as a lot of people described him as, and often punished himself far more than anyone else. He was seen on the security footage, walking to the back bathroom of this particular gas station, carrying two backpacks. When he left, he had neither backpack, and what was in those backpacks led to an even greater mystery. On March 8, Chip's roommate, Tanya Rios, couldn't find Chip. So she made a Facebook post asking if anyone had seen him. His home was in a complete mess, his phone was found in the bathroom with its battery ripped out, and he hadn't taken any of his insulin, which is kind of important when you have diabetes. When Tanya first arrived, the front door was wedged shut, the side door was wide open, as was the fridge, and vials of Chip's insulin were all over the kitchen floor. There was a duffel bag full of clothes packed in Chip's room, which he had apparently left, and Chip's dog was roaming free around the house, something that apparently Chip would never allow. So police got involved, they started the search, and this led them to the security footage at the gas station, and to Chip and the two backpacks. In the first backpack was a bunch of documents. Chip's EBT card, social security card, a copy of his dad's birth certificate, and two blank bank deposit forms. He also had some medical supplies, like a diabetic testing kit, a single vial of insulin, and an inhaler for his asthma. In the second backpack was some clothing, some food, and some supplies. Pencils, pens, a rope, and a steel blow dart. So the family started looking around for anyone who might have influenced gentle giant Chip into running away and going down this dark path. And naturally, they first looked to his roommate, Tanya. There are a lot of details in this case, so I'll just quickly go through them. They found that Tanya actually had a warrant out for her arrest. In in a neighboring county. And after posting bail and returning to the house, Chip's family wanted her out from there. Tanya wasn't paying rent, and the house actually belonged to Chip's dad, Reggie. It took a while to get her to leave as she was claiming squatters' rights, but during that time, they also found out that someone was forging checks in the name of Chip's father, Reggie, and his account was now overdrawn. This someone would later turn out to be Tanya. She was arrested again, and when the family went back to their home, they noticed that it was a complete dump. Plates and bowls were smashed, a bunch of these spoons were filthy, and bent, and everything else was covered in filth. The home had apparently been used as a drug den for months. This is while Chip was living there. They later also found a makeshift meth lab in the attic, and after all of this, Chip's body was never found. Tanya was never charged with anything related to Chip's disappearance or death, and Chip's family eventually cleaned the entire house back to how it originally was. It's still unknown whether Chip was killed, maybe to stop him telling someone about the drug drug and fraud operation that was going on, or whether he went off intentionally. The fact that he left all of his insulin behind really doesn't look good, but to this day, gentle giant Chip's fate is unknown. Christopher Morris. This was an 11-year-old boy found dead in a dishwasher in Texas 2000. Christopher's dad came home from work one day and found his son mutilated, naked, and stuffed in a dishwasher. This was a really messed up case, and there's honestly not much online about it, but sadly, after hundreds of interviews and thousands of hours of investigations, Christopher's killer has still not been found. Cicada 3301 was the name given to three sets of puzzles posted online between 2012 and 2014. The first round of puzzles ran for nearly a month, with the second beginning a year later and the third a year after that. The third puzzle has not to this day been solved, 
and the puzzle's stated intent was to recruit intelligent individuals. They focused heavily on data security, cryptography, steganography, and internet anonymity. The creator of these puzzles has never been revealed, and many speculate that they were recruitment tools for the NSA, CIA, MI6, a cult of some sort, or a cyber mercenary group. They haven't posted a puzzle since 2015, and the, some would argue, bigger puzzle of who Cicada 3301 was has never been solved. Colleen Wood was a 53-year-old mother of two who went missing without a trace in Florida 2000. There was no body, no note from her, no sign of a struggle or foul play. She was just there one second and gone the next. She was dating at the time former professional race driver John Lee Paul, and months after she disappeared, he also mysteriously vanished. John was a bigwig in the finance world, being a Wall Street investor sort of guy, and Colleen told him that she had always wanted to sail around the world. It was her dream since before she could remember. So John said, yeah, let's do it. And Colleen sold everything she had and went on this trip with John on his boat, the Island Girl. The last person to speak with her was Maureen Canada. This was on December 14th and Colleen said that she was at a bar in Key West with John and that she was having a grand old time. After this, she was never heard from or seen again. The family later found out that John had actually done time in prison after he started a drug smuggling ring and tried to kill his partner in crime. He had served 15 years for this and was actually still on parole. So his plans with Colleen to sail around the world would completely violate his parole and wasn't something he could even legally do. After Colleen's disappearance, John said that he and Colleen had broken up in December and that he hadn't seen her since. Investigators found that Colleen's cards had withdrawn over $40,000 in Fort Lauderdale between December and February, and evidence showed that she wasn't the one making these withdrawals. The police said that it was multiple different women making the withdrawals, and these women weren't Colleen and obviously weren't John, and so Colleen was never found. After a while of investigating, authorities tried to bring John in for questioning, but found that he had apparently left town on his boat, violating his parole, and he has been missing ever since. He had been known to sail across the Atlantic on several occasions, so where he is on his boat right now is anybody's guess coronal heating. So say you're near a campfire. It's pretty hot, so you move away and it gets cooler. This is quite normal, but it's not how it works on the sun. The surface of the sun is roughly 10,000 degrees Fahrenheit, which is pretty hot, but the sun's upper atmosphere, which is a lot closer to us, burns at an incredible several million degrees, 500 times hotter than its surface. Scientists think that there must be certain reactions going on in the sun's upper atmosphere that leads to this level of heat generation, but we don't know for sure and it is currently a mystery. The Cowden family. Richard and Belinda Cowden and their two children, David and Melissa, went missing from a campground in the Siskiyou Mountains in Oregon, 1974. Belinda's mother first discovered that they were missing when she went to check on them where they were staying and found everything as if they had just walked out. There was food prepared and Richard's wallet and wristwatch were just lying on the floor. So Belinda's mum called the police. Their disappearance resulted in one of the largest search efforts ever in Oregon and their bodies were found seven months later, 11 kilometers from their campsite. They had died from being shot with 22 caliber bullets, and police did strongly suspect a man named Dwayne Lee Little, who was a convicted killer. He was on parole around the time that the Cowdens were killed. He owned a 22 caliber gun, and they were able to determine that he was nearby the campgrounds on the weekend that the family went missing, but partly because the evidence was circumstantial, and because he was already serving three life sentences, he was never convicted for these murders, and to this day, they remain technically unsolved. The Dare Stones so to explain this one, we need to go back to 1587 England. A woman named Eleanor White Dare was a member of the colony of North Carolina in what eventually became the United States. She was married to a stone carver named Ananias Dare and she gave birth to Virginia, the first ever child born in North America to English parents. This family, along with everyone else in the colony, now dubbed the Lost Colony, mysteriously disappeared when her father had gone back to England to get supplies 
supplies for the colony. Then in the 1930s, 48 stones were found in North Georgia and North and South Carolina. These were named the Dare Stones, as they told the story of what happened to the lost colony while Eleanor's father was in England. The first stone tells of the death of Eleanor's daughter and husband at the hands of the natives in 1591. Each of these stones was addressed to John White, Eleanor's father, and each was signed off with Eleanor's name. The stones gave the direction that the colony had gone in and called for revenge against the savage natives. A stone dated to 1592 indicated that the surviving members of the colony had reached a sanctuary in the Nakuchi Valley area and had actually lived there for a while. Another stone from 1598 indicated that Eleanor had married the leader of the tribe there and a stone dated to 1599 announced Eleanor's death indicating that she had left behind a daughter named Agnes. Some historians have labeled all the stones except the first one as a hoax, but others, including myself, like to think that these stones are real and that they map the true journey and tale of the lost colony. I will just say, if you are enjoying the video, do please give it a like. And if you'd like to keep up with the rest of this iceberg, do hit the subscribe and bell buttons to ensure that you do not miss any future episodes. Dennis Martin was a six-year-old boy who went missing in 1970. 69 Tennessee. This was in the Great Smoky Mountains National Park and he was hiking with his family when his father saw him hide behind a bush. Apparently Dennis was looking to wait there and jump out at his other family members as they came by but after not seeing him for about five minutes his father went around the bush to look for him and he was nowhere to be seen. His family ran in all directions and searched for a while before getting help from the park rangers. It was the biggest search in the park's history involving more than four 1400 searches and covering over 56 square miles. They found a child's footprints, with one foot being the type of shoe that Dennis was wearing and the other one being barefoot. Barefoot as in he didn't have a shoe on, not like an actual bear's foot. These prints led to a stream and then ended. Dennis was sadly never found and the park officials believe that he likely just became lost and died from exposure. But others believe that he was either attacked by a bear and carried off or he was abducted by someone and taken from the park. Diogenes Honest Man. Diogenes the Cynic was a man who lived in a barrel for most of his life outside the city-state of Corinth in the 4th century BC. He was kind of an ancient hippie and thought that no one could be completely truthful or honest as they were dictated by and slaves to rules and taboos. He was known to wander around ancient Greece with a lantern searching for an honest man. He was named a cynic because he didn't believe that anyone could be truly honest and yet he was all always searching for an honest man. It is thought that maybe because he and his father were accused of stealing money from the minting house that they worked in, that he was trying to prove that no honest man existed. And so the accusations against him were meaningless. Or maybe he was a cynic who was just a disappointed idealist, and deep down he believed that he would one day find a truly honest man. But nobody knows why he, as a cynic, was always searching for an honest man. And no one truly knows whether he ended up actually finding one. The disciple whom Jesus loved was a phrase used six times in the Gospel of John. It is not mentioned in any other New Testament account of Jesus, and to this day nobody knows what disciple this is referring to. There are a few different theories about who this might be, but nothing concrete. So without further ado, grab a drink. My choice today is green tea, and join me as we explore the unsolved mystery iceberg. So first up we have Don Decker. This was a man in 1983 Pennsylvania Pennsylvania, who claimed to be able to make rain out of thin air. His ability to do this, he said, came from a demonic possession, which happened just after the death of his grandfather. His grandfather was apparently abusing him, and after his death, he was seemingly haunted by his grandfather, with one occurrence describing him being in a room, and rain just seemingly coming from the ceiling, from the walls, just all over, and they weren't able to find a source for the rain. And there's not much evidence for this one, it's really just whether you you believe his account or you don't. Dora Ruth Smith was the strange case of a 47 year old woman who went missing in 1977 Alabama. She was last seen in her house and then apparently just left her house in the middle of the night never to be seen again. She left behind like everything she had. Her dentures, her purse, her keys, even all of her clothes and she was just wearing a nightgown when she left. Her husband said he saw her get into a lime green Ford car but that car has never been located 
identified or found or identified. In 2003, so 26 years after Dora went missing, the people living in Dora's old home found an envelope containing a letter and cash. There was like $200 cash in there and the letter said they are trying to take my food away and kill me. Please help me. So it was as if she was storing this letter secretly in the walls and was maybe planning on sending it to someone, but she unfortunately never got the chance. So after her disappearance, they did a whole search. They did somewhat suspect foul play or murder and cadaver dogs did actually pick up on a scent in a certain area of the garden. But after they dug around the area, nothing was really found. Dora's family believes that the police simply didn't dig deep enough, but that was the extent and outcome of the investigation. So as of today, it remains a mystery. Dr. Disrespect Twitch ban. So Dr. Disrespect, for those who don't know, is this guy. He is a or was a Twitch streamer who played this over the top 80s action hero sort of figure. Anyway, he was pretty popular at the time and pretty entertaining to watch, I guess. And he was one of the biggest streamers on Twitch until he was banned in 2020 for unknown reasons. So in March of that year, he had basically signed a contract with Twitch, which extended for multiple years and it paid him to stay on the platform. But in June of that year, only a few months later, his channel was suddenly removed from Twitch and there were rumors going around that he was permanently banned. Soon after this, Twitch said that Dr. Disrespect had violated some community guidelines, but they wouldn't give any more information and initially Dr. Disrespect had no idea why he was banned. Later on he did eventually find out, but he never made that reason clear to the public. He has remained banned ever since. He moved to YouTube for his streaming platform and a year later Dr disrespect decided to sue Twitch for banning him and after a year of litigation they both just decided to settle with neither side admitting any faults and with no money exchanging hands and to this day the reason why one of the most popular streamers was banned from Twitch is still unknown. So Dracula is a reference to the lost 1920s Russian film. Very little is known about it or whether it did even exist at all. According to some sources, Viktor Tozhansky was the director of the film, but claims like that are very, very far from being confirmed. We don't know anything about the plot or the actors in the film, and we don't have any footage or even stills of it. But if this film does or did exist, it would actually be the first film adaptation of Bram Stoker's 1897 Dracula novel. Some people suggest that if it was made in the 1920s, that it may very well have been destroyed in the Russian Civil War, or that the claim that it was made in the 1920s is a little unbelievable and far-fetched, as most film productions stopped in Russia during their civil war. But it is an interesting one, even if this is all we have to go off. Earth's water. So here's another space one, and that is the question of where Earth's water came from. If you've ever looked out into the ocean, you can see that we have a lot of water, obviously. But there are quite a few theories about where this water might have come from. So I'll do a little demonstration here. But after the birth of our sun, there was a nest of gas surrounding the sun after the explosion. This mix of gases orbited the sun and is known as the solar nebula. This mixture of stuff contained in it all the necessary elements to build all of our planets. And actually the composition of our planets for the most part depends on how far away from the sun they were. But back to the topic of water, hydrogen, which is one of water's elements, was actually around back then. But the early earth likely didn't have enough time or size to collect and hold a lot of this hydrogen hydrogen before it escaped out into space. And if these gases didn't come from the solar nebula, then where did they come from? Well, more and more scientists think that the water must have come from space in the form of comets. So when the solar system was forming, the planets closer to the center were far too warm to 
form ice. But ice would have likely been able to form on the planets that were further out. So one theory suggests that the oxygen and hydrogen formed water. The water then froze around planets like Jupiter. Then in the relatively early years of the solar system, the larger planets would essentially launch debris and comets at the inner smaller ones due to essentially things falling out of orbit with the larger ones and flying towards the center of the solar system. Some of these were apparently comets of solid ice. They hit into our young earth and these all eventually melted forming the lovely water we know today. This is a friendly reminder to remember to drink water. Another theory suggests that instead of ice in the form of comets, earth was bombarded by asteroids which didn't store the elements as water, but rather stored them as mineral in rocks. So these asteroids hit into our early Earth, and the rocks from the asteroids over time got absorbed into our Earth's mantle. And when eventually exposed to our incredibly hot core, these rocks melted, the elements combined, and they formed water. And the water came up to the surface eventually through volcanoes and stuff like cracks in our Earth's mantle. This was probably in the form of something like steam, which then eventually got recycled and settled as water. So this topic goes a lot deeper into many of these theories, and it was as always a super interesting one to research. But if you like stuff on space or the early Earth's timeline, then definitely check this one out. The East Bay Rock Walls are a series of rocky walls built all over California. These are mainly in the San Francisco area and their origin is more or less unknown. They aren't walls or fences, so to speak, as they aren't continuous and they don't actually go up very high. They were thought maybe to have been used as marking areas for travelers or of barriers of some sort to help with rounding up animals, but their actual purpose is still a mystery as there are no records as to who built them, when or why. There were recently some tests done on the rocks, which suggest that they were built somewhere between 1850 and 1880. So this would have been in an early American California, but whether they were built by early European settlers, Native Americans, Mexicans, or someone or something else entirely, we have no clue. Eileen Moore Lighthouse Keepers. This is a reference to a small island in the Hebrides, which in itself is an archipelago or collection of many small islands off the coast of Scotland. This particular small island, Eileen Moore, was completely uninhabited except for the lighthouse keepers who lived on the island. In 1900, a small ship was headed to the island that actually had a replacement lighthouse keeper, Joseph more on board. When they arrived to the island, none of the three lighthouse keepers were there to greet them, so they blared their ship's horn and still received no response. They then fired a flare, and when they got no response to that, they began to get a bit worried. Joseph Moore then took a rowboat to the island, and he slowly made his way up the cliff to the lighthouse. Apparently on his journey up there, he had an overwhelming sense of bad foreboding. When he reached the lighthouse, he noticed immediately that something was wrong. The front door of the lighthouse was left open and two of the heavy raincoats were missing. He went onto the kitchen area and found that there was a meal that was half eaten and a chair that had been upturned. So it was almost as if someone was eating at the table and then jumped up quickly in a hurry and didn't finish their meal. On top of this, the clocks had all mysteriously stopped and they figured that whatever happened must have happened around a week ago as that's when the logs for the lighthouse stopped and after discovering all this they did a full search of the island but found no bodies. When they did further checks of the logs of the lighthouse they noticed some of the entries were a bit strange. A week before this incident the second assistant had written of winds so severe that they hadn't seen anything like them in 20 years. He noted that the principal lighthouse keeper was unusually 
quiet and that the third assistant had been crying. Now, the third assistant, who was William MacArthur, was a seasoned mariner and he was known for being kind of a tough guy. So for him to be crying over a bit of wind seems really strange. The next day in the logs, December 13th, stated that the storm had actually gotten worse and that all three of the men were praying. And this entry is also kind of strange, as you wouldn't expect three seasoned seamen and lighthouse keepers, who must be completely used to wind and rain and heavy storms by now, and who must have known that they were perfectly safe up in the lighthouse where they were, which was a brand new lighthouse at the time, and was very high up above the ocean on an island. So to be worried and praying about a storm seemed a little strange. And to make things even stranger, there were no reported storms on the 12th, 13th or 14th of December, with all reported conditions being calm and steady. The final log entry marked on the 15th of December simply stated, storm ended, sea calm, God is over all. But what was meant by God is over all is still unknown. Why any of the lighthouse keepers would leave the lighthouse in the middle of winter without one of their coats is one part of the mystery as is why all three men left together, because this is strictly prohibited and abnormal in the rules and regulations for the lighthouse, which states that there must always be at least one lighthouse keeper in the lighthouse at all times, just in case emergencies or in case of accidents, they would always have one lighthouse keeper maintaining or monitoring the lighthouse. Further searches of the island revealed a bunch of rope, which was just scattered and strewn over the rocks near the landing platform. Platform. These ropes were normally stored in a crate attached to the supply crane, which was 70 feet above the landing platform. So the first theory they came up with was that the crane had fallen down in the high winds and the crew had gone down to rescue the crane and had all been hit with an unexpected wave and dragged out into the ocean. But there were several holes in this theory. Why was one of the men without a coat in the middle of the winter? Why had none of the bodies then washed off? on shore? Why did all three of the men leave at the same time when they knew it was against the rules? And how were three very experienced seamen and lighthouse keepers surprised by a wave? You'd think if anyone would have been able to maneuver this situation, that it would have been these three men. And that all brings us back to the lack of reported storms by nearby islands. The Lewis Island, which is actually able to view the lighthouse at Eileen Moore with the naked eye, reported a clear sea and a clear view of the lighthouse during those three days. So today, 123 years later, the disappearance of these three men and the strange circumstances surrounding them remains a mystery to us. Some people suggest it was poisoning, which then led to group hysteria and delusions. Some suggest that pirates or invaders took the men, and some suggest it was an alien abduction. But nobody really knows, and maybe no one except those three men men will ever know. Einstein's Last Words Einstein's Last Words is a reference to the fact that just before his death, Einstein uttered a few words, or a sentence, or two sentences. It's a little unclear, but it was in his native tongue of German. The mystery, however, comes from the fact that the nurse, who was the only person in the room with him at the time, didn't actually speak German. So, whatever he said in those final moments, and what thoughts he was expressing to himself or to the world, we will never know. El Chupacabra is a creature reported in various areas of the Americas. It is literally Spanish for goat sucker, which, while that makes for a great insult, actually refers to the fact that El Chupacabra is known for attacking and sucking the blood out of livestock, including goats. It is often described as a heavy reptilian alien-like creature, roughly the size of a small bear, and with a row of spines reaching from the neck to the base of the tail. However, in some sightings, it has also been described as more dog-like. So in 1975, a series of livestock killings was reported in the small town of Moca, Puerto Rico. These were attributed to Vampiro de Moca, and since then, similar attacks on livestock have been reported ever since. These animals were found dead, completely drained of blood, with small incision holes somewhere on their bodies. Theories of who or what made these attacks range from aliens to satanic 
cults, but over time the legend of El Chupacabra became the main suspect in a lot of these cases. But El Chupacabra has never been captured, so there are many that believe that it is still out there roaming around, hunting, and draining its prey completely of blood. El Loco is the name for a dwarf-like creature that lives in the forests of the Congo. They eat only human flesh and are thought to be spiritual ancestors of the people who live there. El Loco, which is the plural for El Loco, are said to live in the deepest, darkest parts of the rainforest, and they are apparently quite jealous quite vicious, and they ferociously guard the forest's rare game and fruit. They live inside hollow trees and they wear nothing but leaves, and they have no hair with only grass growing on their bodies. They also have piercing eyes, sharp claws, and mouths that can open wide enough to consume an entire human, dead or alive. They also possess small bells, which are used to cast spells on anyone nearby, but it is thought that carrying a amulet or something similar will ward off any spells if you are unlucky enough to be targeted by one. One tale cited by Jan Nappert goes like this. One day, a hunter took his wife, at her insistence, into the rainforest, where he had a hut with a palisade around it. When he went out to inspect his traps, he told her, when you hear a bell, do not move. If you do, you will die. Soon after he had left, she heard the charming sound of a little bell coming closer, for the Aloko has a good nose for feminine flesh. Finally, a gentle voice asked to be let into his room. It was like the voice of a child. The woman opened the door, and there was an Aloko, smelling like the forest, looking small and innocent. She offered him banana mash with fried fish, but he refused. We eat only human meat. I have not eaten for a long time. Give me a piece of your arm. At last, the woman consented, totally under the spell of the Aloko. That night, the husband found her bones. This is pretty creepy stuff, but I guess the moral of the story is that if you ever go to the Congo, always bring an amulet with you. On June 16th, 1991, a bank robbery and shooting took place at the United Bank Tower in Denver, Colorado. The bank robber killed four unarmed bank guards and forced six bank tellers into the vault. Roughly $200,000 was stolen from the bank, and this honestly seems to be like a one-man heist rather than a full bank robbery. The suspect snuck in through the back elevator, convincing the guard that he was someone of importance. Then he forced the guard at gunpoint to go down to the lower level of the bank, where he killed him and took his security pass. Using this pass, he then went to the guard room, where he killed three other guards and then went on to do the bank robbery. None of the guards were actually armed, as a year before this, the United Bank Tower had actually changed their policy that meant that the guards weren't allowed to have guns. During the robbery, the suspect picked up all of the casings from the bullets that he had fired, and he also removed several tapes of security footage and guard logs, meaning that there was less evidence overall to find out who did this. Three weeks after the robbery, police arrested James W. King, who was a retired police officer, for this robbery. But after only a few days of deliberation. The jury acquitted James King, and since then, no one else has been brought forward, none of the stolen money was ever found, and the identity of the robber remains a complete mystery. Flying mist mattress was a phenomenon seen by a lady in 2001, Kansas. Judy and her friend were driving along Highway 36 when a large rectangular mist flew across the road in front of them. The cloud was described as being wider than her car, two feet thick and hovering three feet above the road. It was never properly explained, but people suspect that it could be the doing of ghosts, aliens, a secret government project, or just a very peculiar weather occurrence. Frances Marshall was a woman killed in New Zealand 1914. She had been missing that night after visiting a friend, and when her husband woke up that morning, he was informed that she had been murdered. She was found in an alleyway with 25 wounds to her head, neck, and chest. Her skull was fractured, and her heart and lungs had been stabbed multiple times. She likely died 
aside from just sheer blood loss, and there was no sign of a struggle or robbery, and no knife ever found. There were also no reports of a disturbance of any kind by anyone, so it's likely that she was just ambushed and taken by surprise. She was wearing just one of her gloves at the time, and her hat was still strangely on her head when she was found. There was very little information regarding this case, but it's still one of the most horrific cases in New Zealand since the First World War. The Frog Boys were a group of five boys in South Korea who went missing in 1991. They were aged between 9 and 13, and all disappeared after searching for salamander eggs during a public holiday. The president of South Korea ordered a massive search by police and military, but sadly the boys weren't found. Until 2002, 11 years later, the remains of the boys were found nearby where they went missing. The bodies showed signs of blunt force trauma, and they were very likely taken and attacked by someone, but to this day nobody has been charged for these horrific crimes, and the rhyme or reason for them is still unknown. There was actually a sixth boy in the group, but he left and went back home after his mum had warned him not to stray too far, which saved his life and has likely stuck with him to this day. Functionalism. So this is a pretty complex philosophical one, but functionalism basically defines states or emotions, not by their internal components and structures, but by their function. As an example, pain isn't defined by our nerves or brain states, but rather as a state that tends to be caused by bodily injury to produce the belief that something is wrong with the body and the desire to be out of that state, to produce anxiety and in the absence of any stronger conflicting desires to cause wincing or moaning. So by this definition, pain can even be felt by things like robots and androids. This is a very interesting and deep one on the meaning of things. So if meaning is your thing, definitely check it out. Gloria Sullivan was a 14 year old girl murdered in 1943. She had led a rough early life being abandoned by her parents and then growing up in foster care. The foster mum had died a few years back and the foster dad was out to work every day. So that left Gloria at home to do the chores and the shopping and the cooking and the cleaning and all of her schoolwork as well. She was apparently very good at these things and the foster father Patrick truly loved her as he would his own child. Throughout the morning of that fateful day, various neighbours came by to see Gloria, either just to chat or to return something that they borrowed and none of them really noticed anything strange. Then at 10.20am, Dorothy Weedig, who was a schoolmate of Gloria's, turned up at the house as they had arranged to go on a little shopping trip. But the front door was locked from the inside, the curtains were drawn, and there was no answer when Dorothy knocked, so she just eventually left. Then when Patrick came home from work, he immediately noticed that something was off. The front door was unlocked and the radio in the house was turned on and it was turned all the way up. Patrick walked in and when he entered the kitchen, he found Gloria lying dead on the floor, having been stabbed 20 times in the back, chest and throat. Gloria was fully dressed and there was no signs of an assault and the rest of the house was in perfect order, with nothing even being taken. Everyone who knew Gloria couldn't reasonably come up with a motive for her killing or any potential suspects. She didn't have any enemies, she didn't have any boyfriends or potential boyfriends. It was a really strange killing with seemingly no motive. They suspected it might have been her biological father who killed her for some reason, but when they went to look for him, he had apparently just disappeared off the face of the earth, and he was declared legally dead in 1950. Patrick would sadly never get over the death of his foster daughter, and would frequently visit the police station to check if anything new had come up on the case. He died four years after this from a heart attack at only 59 years years old. Although there was some evidence found at the scene, like various blood prints, the killer was never found and this brutal, senseless killing was never solved. Gordon Sanderson was a 26 year old man found shot dead in a septic tank in Alberta. In 1977 he was found unidentified, but tests done in 2021 found him to be Gordon Sanderson. He was an indigenous man and was found wrapped in a yellow bedsheet tied with nylon rope. Before his death, Gordon was tortured. He was beaten, tied up, 
burnt with a torch and cigarettes, and had his you-know-what mutilated with a sharp object. He was then shot at least twice in the head and chest, before being dumped in the septic tank in which he was found. The authorities had very little to go off on this one, so his case just kind of went cold and it was never solved. Granger Taylor was a 32-year-old man who went missing in 1980 British Columbia. Granger was big into aliens, the man's got taste, and would often talk about them, even building his own life-size spacecraft with a friend out of old satellite dishes. On the day of his disappearance, his stepfather noticed a note on his bedroom door. On the back of the map was a hand-drawn map of one of the local mountains, and on the front was a note. Dear mother and father, I have gone away to walk aboard an alien spaceship. As recurring dreams assured, a 42-month interstellar voyage to explore the vast universe and then return. I'm leaving behind all my possessions to you, as I will no longer require the use of any. Please use the instructions in my will as a guide to help. Love, Granger. In his will, Granger had recently made two edits. One, the word funeral was deleted, and two, the word death was replaced with the word departure. He was never seen again, but some bones and a shirt were found in a nearby mountain six years later that were strongly suspected to belong to Granger, so the case was closed. But many close friends and family believe this not to have been Granger, but suspect that the government had kidnapped him for certain alien knowledge that he had, or that he had been murdered and covered up, or that he had actually departed on a journey across the universe. But whichever one you believe, it is a sad case that Taylor Granger, who was loved by many, never made his return. So without further ado, grab a drink. My choice today is Lapsang Tea, which it's pretty smoky, this one. But you are welcome to join me as we explore the Unsolved Mystery Iceberg. So up first, we have the Grassman. This is a tall bipedal hominid that is thought to stalk the woods of Ohio. It is reportedly very similar to something like Bigfoot, but much more aggressive. Its first modern sighting was in 1978, but the natives of the area spoke of a race of bipedal creatures that they described as ape men going back as far as the 1700s. They also refer to these as the wild ones of the woods. The grassman's name partly comes from these hut and nest-like structures that it apparently builds in the woods out of tall grass. There are some theories and questions about whether the grassman is actually related to other similar creatures like the Sasquatch, Yeti, and Bigfoot, or whether it's its entirely own species. The Grim Reaper of the Grand Canyon. This was a photograph taken in the 1980s of a family's trip to the Grand Canyon. The family was having a great time and they were apparently alone that day, but after they had the photographs processed, they noticed something terrifying in the background of one of the photos. As one of the family members was posing for a photograph on the edge of a drop, behind him in the bushes, the camera catches the image of a tall, pale, bald man in a dark cloak. This one is pretty creepy and some people think it was evidence of the Grim Reaper waiting to take this man's life if he just so happened to step out a little further than he should have. The Hinterkaifeck murders. So to start off on this one, we have to go back six months before the murders. This is when strange things started happening on the Hinterkaifeck farm. The maid at the time had recently quit as she said she heard creepy, terrifying noises coming from the attic, but no one believed her. That same year on the farm, they had found an unusual newspaper, which no one in the family or on the farm or in the local neighborhood actually subscribed to. And just days before the murder, the family found footprints in the snow, and when they followed the footprints, it led to a door to their machine room, and the lock on the door was broken. During that night, the father of the home, Andreas Gruber, actually heard footsteps in the attic, but when he went up to search and check the attic, he found nothing. He had apparently told several people in the community about all these things that he noticed and found, but refused help from anyone else on any farm or from the local police. The new maid arrived on March 31st of that year, and late that evening, Andreas, his wife, his daughter Victoria, and his granddaughter were all lured to the family barn and were brutally killed one by one. The killer then made his way into the main house, where he killed the grandson and the newly arrived maid in their bedrooms. The killer likely used a small pickaxe that he found on the farm for the attacks, and there's evidence that he stacked up the bodies that were 
were in the barn and actually lived in the main house for three days with the other bodies. For some reason, the killer actually fed the cows during these three days, and he finished the entire supply of bread that they had on the farm. The bodies were found four days later, and they suspected and interviewed a bunch of people. You had local workers, handymen, people who were in local villages, travelers, merchants, gypsies, and they even investigated a few mysterious figures that were seen in the woods. They even suspected that the father of the two children, who was Victoria's dead husband, hadn't actually died in World War II like they thought, and that he had come back for revenge of some sort. There was no compelling evidence for this theory, but they went quite far in their investigation of other people, and sadly, they never really came to a solid suspect. The case was closed in 1955, and this wild, eerie story of the killer creeping around their attic was never solved. The Iron Pillar of Delhi was a 7 meter tall iron pillar set up by Chandragupta II in the 4th century Delhi, India. It weighs more than 6 tons, and because of the rust resistant material and just quality of the build, it has shown hardly any degradation or wear in the 1600 years of its existence, which is impressive. It was thought to have been originally placed outside of the Udayagiri Caves, and then moved to its current location in the 11th century. The Udayagiri Caves in themselves are super fascinating. They contain a whole series of stone carvings and ancient stories, mainly dedicated to the Hindu gods Vishnu and Shiva, and contain some of the oldest surviving Hindu temples and iconography in the whole of India. The pillar has multiple verses and scriptures written on it, from Sanskrit to something called Gupta script. And it hasn't really been extensively studied, despite being around for so long. Jason Ellis was a police officer who was killed in Bardstown, 2013, Kentucky. He was on his way home where he stopped to clear the road of some tree branches that were in his path. After he got out of his car, he was then shot to death by an unknown assailant, and then just left there for dead until he was found a little while later. This naturally sparked a huge investigation, but they never really got to the bottom of it. As of today, no one has been charged for his murder, but this incident was part of a series of killings and attacks in Bardstown, which might be connected and might not be connected. Bardstown was a relatively quiet, small, peaceful town, and then within just 10 years there was an unusual amount of killings and attacks and missing persons. Some of them were solved, some of them were not solved. A few of them seem connected as they're between different families, but they could just be a complete coincidence. I can maybe try and cover all of the Bardstown's attacks, uh, murders, and try and make connections between them in a later, maybe hour, hour and a half long video. That's if you guys wanted to see more true crime related stuff, but let me know in a comment below if that sounds like something you would be interested in. Jeff Davis A is a reference to the unsolved murders of eight women found in the swamps and canals in and around Jefferson Davis Parish, Louisiana. This was between 2005 and 2009, and most of the bodies were so far decomposed that actually finding a cause of death for them was extremely difficult. A lot of these victims either knew each other, were connected, in some other way, or had similar problems like addiction. Despite this, however, there are multiple suspects for the multiple victims, meaning, at least in the opinion of the law enforcement, this isn't the work of a serial killer. The police investigations regarding these cases was absolutely plagued with mistakes and missteps by the sheriff's department, which led to just a bunch of missing and lost evidence where there really shouldn't have been. And a few of the law enforcement's own witnesses have actually named members of the local law enforcement as suspects in this case. So this one might be crazier and go deeper than we can currently see, but a lot of the details of this case, or cases, has been kept under tight wraps by the local law enforcement. And as of today, these eight murders are unsolved. Jim Donnelly was a scientist working at the Glenbrook Steel Mill, Auckland 2004, who went missing under very strange circumstances. He didn't go on a trip anywhere or disappear in the middle of the night. He left his home to go to work, was seen parking up and entering the building, and then heading up to his office, and then was never seen again. A week or two before his disappearance, Jim had been acting kind of strange and suspicious and worried. He had told his wife that he was going to have a meeting or two and would likely be physically and mentally stressed afterwards. This was a bit strange from his wife's perspective, and she never found out who these meetings were with or what they were regarding. A search was started, and during the search, nothing was found except for his hard hat 
found beside an acid vat in the mill. So naturally you might think he accidentally fell into the acid vat and died. So they drained the acid vat and they found his work ID card, his work tablet, safety glasses, credit card, cash, and a single key. This was his work key and the full set that he had normally, which included personal stuff like his home keys and his car keys, were never found. All of these items were found in the acid bath, with his hat being found beside it, but the acid bath contained no human remains. This was a very strange case, and in my eyes there are multiple explanations as to what happened. He could have been kidnapped or killed by someone in the mill. He could have decided to do something to himself, which I think that one is a little bit less likely, because you would probably expect his body to turn up somewhere eventually if no one was hiding it or he might have just faked his death and ran away for some reason it could have been for his own benefit just to get away it could have been maybe he had gotten into something deeper than he should have done hence the suspicious meetings and he was running away to protect his family and all of the items of Jim's that were dumped in the acid vat were either a cheap attempt at faking his death either by Jim or by someone else implying that he fell into the acid vat and died there and just completely disintegrated. Or when Jim was killed, his items were taken and thrown into the acid vat to try and clean them of any evidence. But whatever happened to Jim, it's a very strange case that has not yet been solved. John Paul. So I covered this man in an earlier episode in the disappearance of Colleen Wood. He was Colleen's husband who apparently was with Colleen when she disappeared in the year 2000. There was no body found or enough signs of foul play to warrant an arrest on John Paul, but when police did go to question him, they found that he had disappeared as well. He was actually technically on parole at the time, but had apparently left town on one of his boats. He was known to be an avid sailor and had sailed across the Atlantic on more than one occasion. So where he is right now is probably impossible to say. But by this point he would be in his 80s, so the odds of finding him and bringing anyone to justice is probably slim to none. The Kentucky Meat Shower. This was a very strange incident in 1876, where as the name for this one suggests, for several minutes between 11am and 12 noon, it rained several chunks of red meat, roughly 2 by 2 inches, in Bath County, Kentucky. There are a few theories for this one, the main one being the vulture theory, which said that a group of vultures were startled, took flight, and then as they were mid-air, regurgitated a bunch of food. This was meat, of course, because they were vultures, and this apparently explains the phenomenon. One funny but kind of gross detail I noticed as I was researching this was that they said that the meat appeared to be beef, but according to the first report at the scene, there were two men who tasted it who judged it to be either lamb or deer. Now why you would taste unidentified meat that had fallen from the sky is beyond me. But this was the 1800s, so I guess it was just a different time. The Killing Stone. In the volcanic mountains of Nesu, Japan, there is something called the Sesho Seki, or the Killing Stone, which according to legends, is a stone which contains the transformed corpse of Tomamo no Mei, a beautiful woman who had been part of a secret plot to kill the Emperor Toba, who had reigned from 1107 to 1123. This woman was apparently discovered and captured, and after being found to be an evil Nine Tails vixen, she was trapped in a piece of volcanic rock. It is called the Killing Stone because it constantly releases volcanic and poisonous gases, and has been known to kill several small animals who were found dead around the stone. It was also rumored to kill anyone who touched it. Then, in 2022, the stone was found having been split in two. This terrified some people, as they believed that the evil spirit of Tamamo no Mei was now free, roaming around and taking lives as she wants. It is said that the stone was later destroyed, exercised and cleansed by a Buddhist monk, and scattered to all four corners of Japan, which has comforted a lot of people, but some believe that the spirit of the vixen is still out there roaming around and looking for her next victim. King Ludwig II was a king who ruled Bavaria from 1864 
war until his death in 1886. He was dubbed the Mad King as he was, as some would say, obsessed with extravagant architecture and artistry, and used a huge amount of his own money, even going so far as to take out massive loans to build lavish palaces and castles. His ministers all tried to stop him in these attempts, but they ultimately failed, and so this was used as evidence against him to declare him insane. He was taken into custody and dethroned on the 12th of June 1886, and he and his doctor were found dead the next day under very suspicious circumstances. His death was ruled a suicide because of course it was, and I guess the doctor just decided to do it with him at the same time. It it doesn't make any sense. He went for a stroll with his doctor in the evening, and after not returning, he and his doctor were found in shallow waters up to their chest, and neither of them were alive, which is one hell of a way to choose to go if you're gonna do it to yourself. As I said, it was ruled that he had drowned himself, but there wasn't even any water found in his lungs, so that's kind of impossible. He and his doctor also had head wounds and signs of strangulation, and one theory suggested by a local fisherman said that the two men had been getting in the water and were shot dead by unknown and unseen assailants. So however the two actually died, I don't think they did it to themselves, whether accidentally or on purpose. His brother was then crowned king, but due to having mental issues was later dethroned as well, with their uncle's son, who was regent at the time, declaring himself king. So this might have been one of the many power-hungry plots by uncles, it's always uncles, that we've covered in a few of these entries in the last few episodes. The circumstances on this one are a little unclear as to what actually happened, and partly because it was so long ago, it's kind of unlikely that we will ever discover the truth of what happened that evening. The Kasi is a creature believed to live in Lake Kasaro, Japan. The lake formed in the crater of a volcano, and it's actually the largest lake of its kind in Japan, as well as being the sixth largest overall lake in Japan. This creature, the Kasi is believed to be between 10 and 20 meters in length, is dark brown with a medium sized neck, and actually has humps on its back. Its head looks somewhat like a horse, only bigger. It also has silver eyes and two giraffe like horns on top of its head. It is also reported to make strange grunting and clicking noises, which I'm gonna be honest with you is fucking terrifying. One major characteristic of the Kasi is how fast it swims, with several reports saying that it has traversed the water at the speed of a speedboat, which is roughly 70 to 100 miles per hour, which just imagine the giant head of a horse with silver glowing eyes racing towards you at 100 miles an hour, all while making these creepy clicking noises. It was first sighted in 1970, and since then there have been many, many sightings. There were a few photographs taken of this supposed creature, but the creature itself has never been successfully located or captured. The Koi Kendall Phone Stalker In 2007 Washington, a 16-year-old girl named Courtney Koi Kendall began receiving text messages from her friends, asking why she had sent them a text, just saying the word gay. But Courtney had in fact not sent any text at all, so who did and why did her friends and family think that Courtney was sending these? She initially just brushed it off and thought nothing of it, but soon after this, Courtney herself and her friends and family all started receiving threatening phone calls and texts. These were all from Courtney's phone, or at least from her number. These texts were pretty brutal, a lot of them. Threats of killings, murders, forced assaults, stalking, even the killing of their pets. These were coming in seemingly around the clock at all times, so the people affected by this tried to turn their phones off, change their phone numbers, change their contracts, but nothing really worked. People's ringtones would even change on their own, and so they eventually called the police, and actually while they were there explaining everything to the police, the family's phones all turned on at the same time and started calling each other. They installed a security camera, then got a a call saying that the caller knew the security camera's code. The mum was cutting limes one day in the kitchen when she got a call from an unidentified person saying that they preferred lemons, which I do agree with them on as lemons are clearly better, but the phone company said that they had no idea how something like this could happen, and they weren't aware of any technology that would allow someone to do this. This case was never solved and the texts and calls eventually just died down, but this was a really creepy one nonetheless. 
l'inconnu de la Seine, or the unknown woman of the Seine, was an unidentified young woman pulled out of the river Seine in Paris in the late 1880s. There were no signs of foul play in her death, and a pathologist at the morgue was apparently so taken aback by her beauty that he apparently felt compelled to take a wax plaster cast of her face, which is pretty creepy. And after this, there were questions raised about whether this was actually the face of a drowning girl, as her expression seemed to be so peaceful and content. And throughout the Bohemian period and areas of Paris, this face was used and displayed quite often, and became a popular symbol of kind of morbid beauty, often being compared to paintings like the Mona Lisa. This is a pretty creepy one, but some say a serene and beautiful one. Regardless, she was never identified, and she remains an eerie or beautiful figure to a lot of people. Lars Matank was a 28-year-old German man who went missing in 2014 Bulgaria. He was apparently involved in a fight and was acting strange while he was alone in Bulgaria. He called his mum saying that people were trying to kill him, and one day when he was supposed to be flying home to Germany, he went to the airport to consult a doctor and was later seen on security footage running out out of the airport in the direction of a nearby forest and was never seen again. He had apparently had a fight in a bar over a football team and later that night was beaten up by four men because of this disagreement. He went to a doctor for his fractured jaw and busted eardrum and the doctor advised him not to fly out super soon and prescribed him some pills to take for his injuries. So his friends took their prearranged flights back to Germany and Lars stayed on a little while longer alone in Bulgaria. This is when he called his mum, whispering, saying that people were out to kidnap and kill him, and that she should cancel all of his credit cards. There is CCTV footage of him in the hotel in which he was staying, which shows him pacing up and down the hallways, looking out windows, and hiding in elevators at 1am. He called his mum again, saying that the people that were hunting him were getting closer. So when he visited the doctor on the day he was supposed to be flying out, the doctor said he was acting erratic and nervous, but that he was fine to fly. Lars didn't leave the doctor's office, saying that he had serious doubts about the drugs that he was prescribed, and after a while he yelled, I don't want to die here, I have to get out of here. And he left. He left behind all of his luggage, his wallet, his cell phone, his passport, and was last seen on the CCTV footage running out of the airport and towards this forest. He was often described by people that knew him as fairly normal and nice, and had no history of mental illness or paranoia, but the drug that he was prescribed, Cefprozil, does have a rare side effect of delusions, paranoia, and schizophrenia, which may have caused it in Lars. Either that or it was a plot to drug him and then either kill him or traffic him, which he maybe narrowly avoided or didn't avoid at all. His mother believes that he is still alive out there somewhere, but has perhaps lost his memory. And there have been numerous sightings of him throughout Europe over the years, with him on the side of the road or hitchhiking with long hair and a long beard. But none of the sightings have officially been confirmed to be him. And officially, he hasn't been seen since the day he ran out of the airport towards the forest. Leo was the strange disappearance of 37-year-old Miss Leo and her four-year-old daughter in Taiwan 2008. There's not too much available information for this one, but she was seen going into the Yuanlin Financial Building in Taiwan late at night. According to the building manager, she looked confused and nervous, and both the mother and daughter were wearing red jackets. She went into the elevator and up to the 11th floor, and when they were in the elevator, cameras showed showed that the mother and daughter both took off their shoes and their red jackets. They then left the elevator on the 11th floor and were never seen again. Extensive searches of the building and the surrounding area were done, as it was initially thought that they had maybe jumped off the building. But the woman and her daughter were never found. There's not too much online about this one, but the mother's identity and bank cards were never used after this. And there are no records of her daughter enrolling in any school, so authorities 
think that it is unlikely that the pair just ran away. The color red in local culture is apparently known to attract spirits and ghosts. So with the pair taking off their red jackets on the 11th floor, there is apparently now no one living on the 11th floor due to rumors of it being haunted. But the ultimate fate of Miss Liu and her child is still unknown. The Loch Ness Monster is probably one of the most well-known of these Lapras looking creatures in the world. This creature apparently lives in the Loch Ness, which is basically a large lake in Scotland. It is often known just as Nessie and has had many, many sightings since it was first reported in the 6th century. There are many reported creatures of similar sizes living in similar circumstances and environments, some of which I've actually covered in previous videos, such as the Moa Moa, and some that I haven't covered yet, such as Champ, the Ogopogo, and the Alta Mahaha. Some people think they are all hoaxes. Some people think they are members of an ancient species that's maybe even related to or descended from dinosaurs, and that they are the last of their kinds, trapped and secluded in lakes and locks. Madeline McCain. So this has got to be one of the most well-known and well-funded searches for a missing person in the last 20 years. On May 3rd, 2007, the McCann family was on holiday in Portugal and at around 8 p.m. that evening parents Kate and Jerry McCann put all of their three kids to bed while they went to a restaurant with some friends some 200 feet away from the apartment. They checked on their kids multiple times throughout that night but when they went to check at 10 p.m. Kate discovered that Madeline was missing. A massive search was obviously started but nothing substantial was found and to this day there hasn't really been any solid solid evidence or leads that might explain where Madeline went. There was actually quite recently a sex offender that was brought forward under suspicion of being connected in some way to Madeline's disappearance, but as far as I know, nothing really came of that. There have been many, many theories over the years, with the Portuguese officials actually at one point believing that the parents had accidentally killed Madeline and had covered it up somehow, acting as if she had been taken. And another theory was that the parents actually sold her into trafficking, which is possibly one of the most evil things that I can think of, to her being kidnapped and killed, or kidnapped and trafficked, or just a whole range of possible brutal outcomes. And after 16 years, it doesn't seem like there will be a positive outcome for this one, but some people still hold out on the hope that Madeline is still alive out there somewhere. But the exact details of what happened to Madeline that night are, for now, completely unknown. The Mary Celeste was an American ship found adrift and deserted in the Atlantic 1872 near the Azores Islands. They found the ship damaged and roughed up a little bit but still in seaworthy condition. Her lifeboat was missing, the last entry in the ship's logs was 10 days ago, and there was still more than enough supplies on board. The cargo of alcohol that she was carrying was still fully there and intact, which made the theories of a pirate attack less likely if not impossible, and the crew and captain's personal belongings were still all on board and undisturbed. And no one on board, not the captain or any of the crew members, was ever seen again. Theories did range from a pirate attack to a mutiny to simply an accident, but despite all of these theories, there's actually very little evidence for any one of them. One thing I learned about while researching this one is something called a salvage award. This is a sum of money awarded to salvers, who is just anyone who rescues a ship. This rescue can include crew members and or cargo, and the award payable depends on if the ship or cargo survived. This encourages ships out in the ocean to take a little risk when it comes to saving and salvaging boats or ships that they don't know. The award normally ranges from around 5% to 25% of the estimated value of the salvage, so that's the vessel, cargo, and the people. And on this salvage, the award paid was actually a lot less than usual because the circumstances surrounding it were a little odd and suspicious. And the court officers suspected that there might be either foul play or insurance fraud going on. And as I said, the crew and captain were never found. So what actually became of them is anybody's guess. Mean Girls is a reference to the lost and cancelled DS game that was based on the teen comedy film Mean Girls. This game was apparently planned, made, produced, 
and published and was set to be released in Europe on September 11th, 2009 and in the US on April 20th, 2010. But at the last minute for unknown reasons, both releases were cancelled. No copies, either digital or physical, were ever released. But in 2021, a YouTuber by the name of Ray Mona said that she had come into the possession of one of the games by unknown means and sources and actually released some footage of gameplay on her channel. There was apparently a massive bug in the game that broke the game after only the first minigame. I just said game a lot, but apparently due to an ongoing legal issue, Ray is unable to release the game to the public. But judging by these screenshots, maybe it's best left unreleased. Melon heads are these small humanoids with bulbous, some would say melon shaped heads, said to be found in Ohio, Michigan and Connecticut. They occasionally emerge from their hiding places to attack and kill people and apparently are mostly seen in forested areas, hills and caves. Theories range from them being an ancient humanoid species to them being creatures of alien origin to them being descendants of a criminally insane asylum that was burnt down in the 1960s. Apparently 10 to 20 inmates went missing. They were said to have escaped into the forest resorting to cannibalism and inbreeding in order to survive and this led to their descendants being these small deformed humanoids stalking the dirt roads and looking for their next victim. MH370 was an international passenger flight chartered by Malaysian Airlines that went missing on March 8th 2014. It was flying from Kuala Lumpur Malaysia to Beijing in China and during its flight just mysteriously went missing. There were many many theories about this one and I remember watching some documentaries about it only last year. The plane last made voice contact only less than an hour after its takeoff. This was while it was over the South China Sea and then all of the communication and electronics not necessary to actually fly the plane were manually it seems turned off. An hour after that it failed to show up on any radars and soon after a search was started. At the start of the search they searched the areas of the flight path which kind of makes sense and they even enrolled the help of some civilians who were able to go online and search through a huge amount of underwater scans to try and see maybe wreckage of the plane but nothing was really found. After finding nothing they were quickly running out of options but the plane was apparently found to be picked up on several pings in West Indonesia which is like the complete opposite direction of the original flight path. It's a little unclear but if this was the plane that the pings showed there would be three obvious directions that the plane would have gone after this. They could have turned left towards South Indonesia, right towards maybe Russia or Kazakhstan, or just straight out into the vast Indian Ocean until they ran out of fuel. The plane and its passengers were sadly never found, and theories range from this being an inside job by the pilot, who may or may not have been depressed and wanted to take his own as well as everyone else's life by flying the plane out into the Indian Ocean. This is something however that his family strongly disagree with and they are appalled by these sorts of accusations about him. Another theory was that the plane was shot down by China and then covered up and one of the last major theories is that the plane was hijacked and then flown to Kazakhstan, an ally of Russia, where whatever happened, happened. This case is a super interesting one if you maybe want to kill some time and watch a documentary or two, but it is an interesting and sad case that we never got to the bottom of. Micro black holes. So black holes are mass or energy that is so concentrated that the escape velocity, which is the speed or velocity that something has to go to escape its orbit is so high that it exceeds the speed of light, meaning that even light that gets sucked into its orbit can't escape. Therefore, because light isn't able to escape from the black hole, it appears to us as black. And black holes in general are thought to be no smaller than stellar mass, which is roughly the size and mass of a star. But micro or mini black holes are theoretical tiny black holes, potentially smaller than a single atom. These are thought to have formed just after the big 
Bang, and these primordial black holes are actually something we covered in a previous episode. If these micro black holes do exist, they would mess with the current general theory of relativity, and actually finding one may force us to come up with many different theories about everything in space, science, and our existence. So without further ado, grab a drink. My choice today is green tea with bergamot, and come with me as we explore the unsolved mystery iceberg. Missy Beaver's murder. So this is actually one that I covered on an old channel of mine, and it's actually still up here on YouTube, so if you can find the video and the channel, I would be really impressed. Missy Beavers was a very active mum of three, who regularly held fitness boot camps and classes in the Church of Christ, 20 minutes from where she lived. On the morning of April 18th, 2016, she was found dead inside the church, brutally beaten to death with a hammer or pick. And when they checked the church's security footage, they found this. This person was dressed in police tactical gear and was seen at roughly 4am walking through the hallways, randomly smashing windows and trying to open doors. Then at 4.18am, Missy was seen entering the church and just before the class's start time at 5am, Missy was found dead. There's no footage of the actual murder, but the person in the security footage is thought very, very likely to be the killer. And it's actually somewhat hard to tell if this was a woman or a man. They could have been a broad-shouldered woman, it's kind of hard to tell underneath all of the tactical gear. Their height was kind of middling, so they could have been a shorter guy or a taller woman, but they were never identified. The person in the security footage seems to walk with a limp of sorts, and Missy's husband father actually does walk with a limp but he had a perfect alibi for that morning. The husband of Missy didn't seem overly emotional in any following interviews, but that is sometimes the case when loved ones die in horrific circumstances, as everyone just kind of handles it differently, I guess. And there are many different pieces of evidence pointing in many different directions for this one. One theory suggested that this limp was intentional, as maybe the killer knew that the husband's dad walked with a limp, and so they were maybe trying to frame him. There was no Nothing missing inside of the church, so a burglary gone wrong is kind of unlikely. But it is thought that the killer possibly smashed windows and tried to open doors in order to make it look like a burglary. Missy didn't really have any enemies, so the whole motive behind the killing is still kind of unknown. For a full in-depth rundown on the murder, Missy the different suspects, all the different evidence, and the many theories, I would recommend you check out the full, poor quality, embarrassing video on my old channel. That's if you can find it. The navigation paradox basically says that the more advanced and precise navigation gets through things like GPS, optimization of routes, and coordination between different crafts, the likelihood of collision actually goes up. This is because the routes and paths are so optimized that if communication ever breaks down between two different crafts, they will likely just default to the most optimized route, which is so precise and optimized that many different crafts will take it, resulting in more collisions. The Nazca Lines are a group of what's called geoglyphs in the Nazca Desert, Peru. They were made sometime between 500 BC and 500 AD, and were made by people digging in the desert to a certain pattern, and with this digging they revealed the different kinds coloured earth that was below the sand. This bottom layer, which was very high in lime, reacted with the morning mist and moisture, and actually hardened, forever solidifying the lines in place. These lines could obviously not have been seen from above in the years that they were made, but there have been between 80 and 100 found in recent years with the help of things like drones. The patterns all describe different things. Hummingbirds, fish, monkeys, dogs and cats, and even things like trees and flowers, and there are quite a few different theories as to why they were made. One was to contact or showcase their skills or dedication to things like gods or even aliens, or to indicate and signal water flow in certain areas. Or it could have been something space related, helping them track and locate stars and predict equinoxes. Their purpose is a little unclear, but they are fantastic creations when you think that the people who made them never 
never even saw them as we do today. The ground level view looks pretty normal and mundane and boring. They just seem like random holes dug in the dirt, but they likely made them for all powerful gods. Up high, looking down on their creations, as we do today, which kind of puts things in perspective a little bit. The North Carolina rumbling mountains. This is a reference to the shaking ground and loud booms that were heard and felt in the Bald Mountain, North Carolina, 1874. Some saw smoke and vapors coming out of the ground, leading to fears of a soon to explode volcano. So panic set in and everyone was scared stiff for roughly two months. This received tons of media coverage as all of the newspapers and reporters flocked to the area to investigate. Apparently the rumbles all started after a local preacher held a religious revival, praying that God make the mountain shake and tremble beneath their feet. People were apparently freaking out, releasing their cattle and animals out into the woods and praying like mad as they believed they only had a few days to live. I mean, why they didn't just, you know, move out of the area? I don't know. But when investigators looked for causes of the event, they couldn't even find evidence for the rumbles taking place in the first place. The only evidence there was, was eyewitnesses. There was no evidence for any of the trembles or shakes, or for smoke or steam coming out of the ground. So a few newspapers were naturally a little dubious of the people's claims. And that was it. The occurrences never occurred again, and everyone just went home. Very strange. Nemesis was a hypothetical red or brown dwarf put forward in 1984. It was thought to be orbiting our sun at a distance of 1.5 light years. They theorized that our sun was part of a binary system with a star called Nemesis. Now, binary systems are something that I covered in a previous episode, but it's basically just a system where at the center you have two stars orbiting each other instead of just the one star. Now, normally in binary systems, you'd expect the stars orbiting each other to be a little bit closer than this. But in theory, something like this is perfectly possible. Apparently our sun used to be a member of this binary system and over the years this other star Nemesis had just gotten further and further away as it orbited our sun and this was partly used to explain mass extinctions that apparently happen on earth every roughly 26 million years and it was thought that when Nemesis was in a certain position this somehow led to extinctions. This one's a bit wild and hypothetical, and there's no real evidence for this one outside of theory, but it is a cool one to think about nonetheless. Novelesnaya Street, Jane Doe. This was an unidentified woman found dead in Moscow, 2006. She was shot dead and was thought to be a victim of the later convicted serial killer, Alexander Elestratov. He robbed and killed six people between 2005 and 2007, and and sadly, this Jane Doe was one of them. They were never able to identify her, so who she is remains a mystery. The Oak Island Mystery. This was a very fun one to research and explore, partly because it's about buried treasure, which who doesn't love a good pirate story? And partly because I got to go so in depth with some of the theories on this one. This one is regarding a few unexplained mysteries and objects found on or near Oak Island in Nova Scotia, Canada. This looks to be a fantastic spot to bury treasure if you're a pirate. And this same belief shared amongst people since the 1700s has led over the years to many, many attempts to discover and retrieve this treasure. There are all sorts of theories about what type of treasure might be on this island. Shakespearean manuscripts, the Holy Grail, and the Ark of the Covenant are just some of many that have apparently been buried there by the Knights Templar. Now, if you'll allow me to detour a little bit, while I was researching this, I did a little deep dive into the Knights Templar. Most people will know that they were basically an elite fighting force or order of the Catholic Church. They were among the most elite and skilled fighters during the Crusades, but about 90% of the members in the Order were non-combat members, and a lot of these members were incredible with money and business. The Order innovated and revolutionized a bunch of modern financial techniques and developed one of the earliest forms of banking. They were a two-pronged force, essentially, and allowed them to conquer different countries and areas to secure 
or steal or win various artifacts, money, gold, rare items, etc. And with their financial and business skills, they were able to set up banking systems, organize all of the wealth, make a fair amount of profit from lending money, and so they were quite a well-rounded force. So after 200 years of this, the order eventually began to decline in membership, with King Philip IV of France pressuring Pope Clement to essentially give up and disband the order. Many of the order's members in in France were arrested, tortured into giving false confessions, then burnt at the stake. And a few years after this, the order was officially disbanded. But during this time, a lot of the members naturally fled. Now, the question of where exactly they fled to is still a little uncertain. And a lot of the treasure that they recovered over the years has never been accounted for or recovered. So naturally, there have been many, many theories theories over the years about where the members of the order went and where the treasure that they had is located. One theory suggests that as the order was collapsing, the members of the order took their treasure from Paris to the port in La Rochelle. From there they took a boat to Scotland where they were welcomed by the powerful Sinclair family, who were actually long-term allies of the order. The Sinclair family had actually known the first Grand Master of the Templar Knights, Hugh de Pay and had helped members of the order hide in Scotland for decades. Now, the story goes that because Christianity was so widespread, they hatched a plan to go to a part of the world that Christianity would never reach, the New World, which later became known as North America. And yep, Christianity never reached the New World. The head of the Sinclair family, Henry Sinclair, apparently knew about the New World through his Viking ancestors, who did actually sail to and start small colonies in North America around the 10th century. And the land of the Vikings and Northern Scotland are probably a lot closer than you might think. A lot of the Viking invaders actually settled down and had families, and so a lot of the modern Scottish people are are actually descendants of Vikings. In fact, the red hair that most people associate with the Irish or the Scots actually originated in Vikings, and it was thought that most Vikings at a particular point in time actually had red hair. So the plan was to take all of the members of the order across the Atlantic Ocean using possibly Viking maps. They would take them into the land of the free, home of the brave, with all of their treasure. There are a few bits of somewhat debate evidence for this theory. A guard tower built in Newport, a carving of a knight on a glacial boulder in Westford, and the money pit and treasure on Oak Island. But before I come full circle back around to Oak Island, an interesting theory that I read was that the Freemasons were essentially an offshoot of the Templar Knights, and they were able to access all of the Templars' knowledge and treasure, which allowed them to fight and win the Revolutionary War. But but back to the Oak Island mystery. One theory says that a dying sailor from the crew of Captain Kidd, who died in 1701, swore that there was buried treasure there worth two million pounds, which is close to 150 million today. The story then goes that Daniel McGuinness, a settler in the 1700s, found a depression in the ground while looking for a place to start his farm. Believing this to be the treasure mentioned in the Captain Kidd's story, Daniel then got the help of two other men and began digging in the ground. They apparently found signs of human activity, markings and scrapings, purposefully placed stones, and in some stories, wooden platforms. But they gave up digging at around 30 feet due to superstitious dread, whatever that means. Over the next few hundred years, many, many excavations took place, some going as far down as 235 feet, but many had to stop just due to the pit flooding with water every single time. The water was thought to be connected to the ocean somehow through flood tunnels as it seemed to actually rise and fall with the tide and there were actually divers sent down but these dives didn't identify or find any treasure and interestingly enough people like FDR were actually heavily invested in this mystery even throughout his presidency and up until his death in 1945 as were the actors 
actors Errol Flynn and John Wayne. There is a curse apparently on the treasure that is said to have originated more than a century ago and it states that seven men will die in search of this treasure before the treasure is found and to this date only six men have died. Did the Templars bury their treasure here and through these sinkholes just lose it to the great void of the ocean below? Did they bury it somewhere else on the island or maybe on the mainland? Or did they never make it to North America at all? I actually love these types of mysteries as the more and more you read about it, it kind of reads like you're living a alternate history or history of an alternate reality or potentially an actual version of history. We don't really know. And that is all we have. I'm kidding kidding do not close the video but that was a long entry and i really enjoyed it and if you don't mind me doing mini deep dives like this in the future when i come across a really interesting entry or topic then do let me know in the comments below as otherwise i'll just try and keep them a little bit shorter the ontario lake mystery ancient structure is somewhat related to our last entry as it's in the same area of eastern canada but it takes us back way back to potentially around 10 thousand years ago. History in Eastern Canada is generally divided into two periods. The first being since around the 10th century, which is when early white European settlers came, and the second stage being around a thousand or two years before that, which is represented by rock carvings and glyphs, as well as stone mounds and arrowheads, and these were from the North American natives. But there may very well be a third stage. This takes us as far back back as 10,000 years ago, before there was any forest in the nearby land, and when the land was just recovering from the recent ice age. Human populations back then weren't in the billions, millions, or even thousands. Most every tribe or group of people consisted of maybe a few dozen at the most, maybe up to a hundred in some rare cases per group or tribe. Obviously this was far, far back, the landscape was in entirely different. Ice where there are now trees, water where there is now land, land where there is now water. But there was a fascinating structure found in Ontario Lake that is proof, some people believe, of intelligent life. Likely humans around this era building structures of sorts. What was found was a huge thousand pound rock carefully rested on and propped up by seven smaller rocks. These were all sat on top of an even larger several thousand pound slab, which was on the edge of a under water ledge. So it is thought that these early early humans for some reason built this structure, which at the time might have just been part of the land. The lake was also thought to have been a ancient spot of worship or reverence for these people, which might explain why they chose to build this structure in this particular spot. The Overton Bridge is a bridge on a road approaching Overton House, which is a grandiose semi-famous house in Dunbartonshire, Scotland. It was built in a 1895, but since the 1950s, there have been many, sadly, strangely, reports of dogs either falling off or jumping to their deaths. The fall itself is about 50 feet or 15 meters, and it goes straight down onto the rocks below. It has been morbidly dubbed the dog suicide bridge by some, and there have been a whole range of theories and explanations for this one. Dogs who were normally very well behaved, rational and calm, would just suddenly run off the edge and jump off. Some people believe that the bridge is haunted and there are dark spirits leading and luring the dogs off the edge for whatever reason. Some people believe that the slope of the bridge as well as the foliage kind of blends in with the rocks below so it's kind of an optical illusion for the dogs and they don't really see the height of the fall. And some people believe that other animals such as minks or squirrels are responsible for these incidents. Anyone who owns a dog will know that squirrels drive them mad and apparently dogs go mad for mink scent. 
birds. So it is said that they chase the squirrels in the bushes and follow the scent of these minks, which essentially lead them to being distracted and they go off the edge of the cliff. Whatever you believe is the cause for this phenomenon. It is a little unusual and very sad. So rest in peace to all of those dogs. The Penn Station Sniper. In 1953, a 50-year-old homeless woman was sitting on the floor of a homeless shelter when she was shot in the hip by an unidentified gunman through an open window in the shelter. This was the first of seven sniper attacks in and around the Pennsylvania station over the next two years. All seven victims were shot with a 25 caliber pistol and all were shot through windows, over ledges, basically from anywhere that it would be hard to identify or see the shooter. Because of this, authorities said that the shooter is likely quite young and fit and nimble in order to quickly climb up and out of certain areas. The shootings only stopped when the shooter's seventh victim, an Amtrak engineer, was actually shot in the head while crossing a set of train tracks at 7 a.m. on February 21st, 1984. This was the first and only victim of the shootings to unfortunately pass away, and that marked the end of the shootings. The shooter, sniper, killer was never identified and while it's true that serial killings are often solved many years after they actually take place it does seem somewhat unlikely that the killer behind these 40 year old shootings will ever be caught or brought to justice the persian princess refers to the mummy of an alleged persian princess found in pakistan 2000 it was dated to around 600 bc wrapped in an egyptian style wrapping and rested in a gilded wooden coffin or all inside of a stone sarcophagus. The coffin was carved with a large image of the Faravaha, which is a common symbol in the Zoroastrian religion of Iran. The mummy was laid atop a layer of wax and honey and was adorned with a golden crown and golden chest plate. There was actually an inscription on the chest plate which claimed that she was the unknown daughter of King Xerxes of Persia. It was speculated that she might have been an Egyptian princess that was married to a Persian prince because because mummification was primarily an Egyptian tradition and they had never before found a mummy in Persia. So this was a huge find. However, a little later on, independent parties actually had pieces of the coffin carbon dated and found that it was only 250 years old. So because of this, the police were called Interpol was contacted and they later realized that the corpse wasn't even as old as the 250 year old coffin. The body showed signs of decomposition fungus and the mat underneath the body was only around five years old. Upon further inspection, the Persian that was written on the chest plate actually had modern grammatical errors and the heart of this mummy was removed along with all of the other organs, where in a genuine Egyptian mummification the heart was always left inside the body. So in 2001, it was determined that the Persian princess was likely a woman between the ages of 21 and 25, who had died sometime around 1996, likely from being hit by a car. This death was obviously covered up and made to look like a rare ancient find, and there was an investigation done into this now suspected murder case, but nothing came from it, and this woman identity remains a mystery. Peter Bergman was first spotted in a bus station in Derry Island on the 12th of June 2009. He then boarded a bus to County Sligo carrying a black shoulder bag as well as another piece of luggage. After arriving in Sligo he checked into his hotel, he paid cash and gave the false name of Peter Bergman. He was 5 foot 10 of slender build with blue eyes and short grey hair and he appeared to be in his late 50s early 60s. According to the staff of the hotel he spoke English with a thick German accent and he was seemingly well dressed with clothes that were identified as being from CNA which is a popular retail store in Europe but mostly in Germany and Austria. He was 
was a heavy smoker, often caught on the CCTV camera going outside to smoke quite often. But one time he was seen leaving the hotel carrying a purple bag with him. When he returned from his walk, he had neither the purple bag or the contents. It is thought that he threw the items out in certain areas and bins, but oddly he was never caught on camera and so maybe knew some of the blind spots of the cameras. Because of this, police were never able to identify any of the things that he threw away, and perhaps some of these things were things that maybe identified him. Over the next few days, he purchased several stamps and airmail stickers, and took a taxi down to the local beach. After asking the taxi driver for a nice quiet beach where he could swim, he later returned to the hotel but checked out the next day and headed out with his black shoulder bag the purple bag, as well as a piece of black luggage different to the one that he had before. He walked to the bus station, ordered a coffee and a sandwich, and while he was eating the sandwich, seemingly read or looked at several pieces of paper that were in his pockets. He then tore the papers in half and threw them in the bin. Then he boarded a bus to the beach that he had visited before, and was seen by several people on the beach who said that he was fairly normal and quite friendly. The next morning, Arthur Kinsella and and his son found the man's body lying on the beach at 6 in the morning. He was wearing purple speedos with his underwear over the top of them and a navy t-shirt that was tucked into his speedos. They said a prayer for the man, called the police and Peter was later pronounced dead at 8 a.m. So all in all this case was pretty strange. Most of his clothes were found left behind on the shore but there was no money or wallet or form of identification. There was no evidence of any drowning but also no evidence of any foul play. So it is thought that the man perhaps died of a heart attack after getting into the water. On the outside, the man seemed to be in fairly healthy condition, but when tests were done, he was found to have advanced prostate cancer, as well as bone cancer, and did show signs of some form of heart disease. So a man in his condition would likely have been taking several medications and prescriptions, but there were no drugs found in his system whatsoever. As well as his fake name, he also gave a fake address, and although the Austrian police were later informed of this case, with public appeals even going out in Austrian and German newspapers, Peter was never identified, and no friends, family, or maybe people he knew have ever come forward. The Phantom Sub is a reference to a submarine that was detected directly below the US Navy destroyer in 1945. This ship was patrolling the Pacific coast near San Francisco, when an alarm sounded indicating that an enemy sub was directly below them. Immediately the depth of the sub was set and explosive charges were sent down and after a while these charges hit the sub with a huge explosion heard and felt on the ship. An oil slick was seen coming from below to the surface, indicating that the sub was hit, but they were then unable to detect the sub on the sonar. It was thought at the time that it was likely an enemy sub, maybe a Japanese one, but the sub was never found and it was never confirmed. So many people on board were skeptical that it was even an enemy sub. Years later, haunted by the possibility that this might have been a US sub, one of the crewmen requested the deck log and and war diary for the ship and found that there was no record of the sinking of that submarine and that there wasn't even a record of any submarines being hit off the coast of California. Later on he came to believe that the sub that they hit was a United States sub and that the military had in fact covered the whole thing up. Poe Toaster. So we covered the odd and suspicious death of writer Edgar Allan Poe in a previous episode and he was well liked by a lot of people for his fantastic writing both before and after his death and one of his fans, an unknown unidentified man, donned in a black cape, black hood and silver tipped cane, visited Poe's grave, poured a glass of cognac, gave a toast to Poe and left three roses in a specific layout on the grave along with the unfinished bottle of cognac. He did this often early in the morning when no one was around to see him, and he did this every year for 60 years. Although he kept to himself, didn't really like company, and often went very early in the morning to likely avoid being seen, he was spotted by some witnesses, more so in the later years, after his existence was known about. There were occasionally letters and notes left on Poe's grave, often expressing their love or appreciation for Poe, such as Edgar, 
I haven't forgotten about you. And in 1999, there was a note saying that the original toaster had died the previous year, and the tradition had been passed on to a son. Since then, there were longer letters and notes left, often being cryptic and cynical and critical of various things like the Iraq war. And the final note was left sometime between 2005 and 2008, and hinted that the tradition was coming to an end. So it seems like the younger son who had taken on this tradition, didn't seem to take it as seriously or as purely as his father did, which is sad, but 60 years is a long time to keep up a yearly tradition like this. It is still unknown who they were or why they decided to commemorate Poe, but it is great to see a fantastic writer like Poe being appreciated. Pope Joan was a legend of a female Pope who reigned for two years between 1855 and 1857. Her legend first appeared in several chronicles in the 13th century, and soon after spread all throughout Europe. Most of these stories describe Joan as a very talented, learned woman, who actually became the Pope by disguising herself as a man. Her sex was eventually revealed when she gave birth during a procession, and she died shortly after, either through natural causes or by being murdered. So it is an interesting legend, and it first first appeared in Jean de Maillie's Chronicle, written around 1250, which contained mention of an unnamed female pope, and the later Chronicum Pontificum et Imperatorum in the 13th century further explored this legend, introducing her name as Joan, noting that she ruled in the 9th century, and that she entered the church in order to follow her lover. The legend was thought as completely true until the 16th century, which is when doubts about its truth started to arise. It is now widely thought thought to be just a myth and a legend, but it might be possible that Joan did actually rule, and she fooled and embarrassed the church to such a degree that they just rewrote history and covered the whole thing up. It might be possible. The Prevention Paradox. This is the interesting observation that the majority of cases of a disease actually come from people who are at low to moderate risk of the disease, rather than from people who are at a higher risk for the disease. It sounds a little counterintuitive, but it makes a little more sense once it's explained. Down syndrome cases, as an example, are more likely to occur when a child is born to an older woman. But because so many young women give birth, and so few older women do, there are actually more children with Down syndrome born to younger women than older women. Alcohol problems is another example. Most alcohol problems are actually found in moderate drinkers, not excessive or dependent drinkers. Because yes, while a higher percentage of excessive drinkers will face problems, there are far far fewer excessive drinkers in numbers than there are moderate drinkers. So most of the hospital or health cases are from moderate drinkers. And so there is often a greater overall benefit in slightly reducing risk in the greater population, rather than massively reducing risk in the smaller population. This was a bit of a strange one, but it does make sense when you think about it, and it did kind of blow my mind a little bit. Property dualism is the view that while there is only one type of substance, in the world, which are physical substances like the brain, there are two types of properties in the world, physical or mental properties. Physical properties would be stuff like shape, size and colour, and mental properties would be ideas, sensations and feelings. This one is quite short as it just covers a fairly simple idea, but overall I guess it explores the intangible mysteries of the mind that we are yet able to fully explain like consciousness. Red Bull Racing's Stolen Trophies. So in 2004, 14, a gang of men, all wearing masks, drove a car through the front doors of the Red Bull Racing Company in Milton Keynes, England. They stole 60 motor racing trophies and cash from several cash machines, all in all totaling up to about £900,000. And this series of thefts and break-ins caused an estimated £300,000. The gang was caught soon after, and most of the trophies were recovered, although not all of them, and where the others are to this day, we don't know. Robert Cooper. In 2004, 53-year-old Oki Albert Kite Jr. was found in his own basement, tied up, beaten, tortured, and stabbed to death. His wallet and phone were missing, and his debit card was later used at an ATM by an unidentified man. This man was driving Oki's truck and wearing a ski mask. It is thought that this was likely the killer, and that this killer was likely a man who had rented a room from Oki. This man would apparently go to great lengths to hide his face, 
place when he was in the presence of anyone except Oki. And when they looked into it, they found that all the information this man had given for the rental was all fake information. The name he gave, Robert Cooper, was also fake. It is thought that he was connected in some way to the Turkish Hezbollah due to some similarities in the techniques of torture that were used. And the man's DNA was found at the scene, which linked him to the Balkan area. It is unknown what connection this man had to Oki, if there was any at all, and why this man chose to attack, torture, and kill Oki. But this was all the way back in 2004, and there really hasn't been much, if any, progress on the case. Ronald Hughes was a defense attorney who was appointed to represent Charles Manson, the well-known cult leader and killer, in his trial in 1970. This was over the murder of Tate Labianca, and Charles Manson's strategy was to get three girls in his cult to openly admit to the murder, and to say that Charles Manson himself had nothing to do with it. But two weeks before the trial started, another attorney was appointed to represent Manson, and Ronald Hughes was reassigned to represent one of the other girls in the cult. However, when it came to the trial, Ronald would not let his client openly testify and incriminate herself by admitting to the murder. This infuriated Manson, as Hughes was, intentionally or not, messing with Manson's plan. The trial then went on a 10-day recess, and the last thing that Manson said to Hughes was that he didn't want to see him in the courthouse again. So during these 10 days, Hughes went on a little camping trip with some friends two hours northwest to a remote area in Los Padres National Forest. His friends went back home after a massive rainstorm, but Hughes decided to stay and finish up his closing statement for the case. The others hitchhiked back because this was the 70s, and after that, Hughes would be seen by three hikers, who were the last people to see Hughes alive. The rainstorm just got worse, and flash floods started to happen, and when the trial eventually resumed, Hughes was nowhere to be seen. The trial went on without him, and was eventually concluded, and it was only after four months that a severely decomposed body was found, just seven miles from where Hughes was last seen. This was confirmed to be Hughes, and his body was unclothed, eaten away by animals and had its entire right arm missing. There apparently wasn't any sign of foul play, but the Manson family did take credit for the killing, saying it was part of their retaliation killings, but it's still unclear whether it actually was or they were just doing that in order to seem a little more dangerous and scary. Interestingly, in a little twist of irony, the day that Hugh's body was found was the exact same day that the people on trial were given the death sentence. Just a bit of morbid coincidence. Sabrina Eisen was a five-month-old girl who was kidnapped from her home in Florida in 1997. Her mother, Marlene Eisenberg, woke up at 6 a.m. to find her missing. Their garage door had apparently been left open all night, and the door from the garage to the inside of the house was also left open. So, just based on these circumstances, the police first suspected the mother and her husband, although they denied any involvement. Police thought that the parents' public appeal was a bit suspicious, and they were apparently seen smiling after leaving their house. Marlene took a polygraph test, but was apparently hysterical and screaming and crying while taking it, so the results were inconclusive, and police say that the parents were not cooperative at all, and that they haven't yet been ruled out as suspects in Sabrina's disappearance. There was no sign of forced entry, no apparent motives, and there was no ransom note left. Two years later, the parents were arrested, and they were charged with conspiracy, lying to authorities, and and giving false information. There were also wiretaps of the two parents saying stuff, like the baby's dead and buried. It was found dead because you did it. The baby's dead no matter what you say you just did it. And the father saying, I wish I hadn't hurt her. They don't know the truth, right? The judge, however, didn't agree that this is what the parents said and was kind of jumbled, so it was hard to hear what they were actually saying. And so two years after this, the judge dropped all the charges on the two. And there haven't been any suspects in the case since. There were a few girls who were thought to be Sabrina over the years, but when their DNA was tested, they were found not to be a match. And so the current fate of this once little girl is still unknown. The 
Sandown Clown. This was a strange being encountered by two small children on vacation at Lake Common on the Isle of Wight in 1973. They were following a strange sound, like an ambulance siren, and it led them to this strange creature, which was some sort of cross between a clown, robot, and alien. It was over two meters tall, had a thin frame, and a large spherical head with white paper-like skin. Each hand and foot only had three digits, and it had two antenna-like ears, and a face that seemed to be crudely painted on that didn't move when it spoke or ate. It was shy but friendly, and kindly spoke to the two kids for half an hour before the kids left and this creature was never seen again. Sarah Ann Wood was a 12-year-old girl who was abducted while riding her bike. This was in 1993 New York, and was less than a mile from her home. A convicted child killer, Lewis Stephen Lent Jr., later confessed to kidnapping and killing her, for which he received 25 years, which is a shockingly, disappointingly low and lean sentence for something like this. But despite him admitting to the killing, Sarah's body was never found. And despite extensive searches and questionings of Lent Jr., she never turned up. Sarah was described by many as an incredibly kind, clever, funny kid, sometimes described as the happiest girl in the world, always laughing and making people smile, and it is an utter, utter tragedy that she was taken from this world by this absolute disgusting monster. So without further ado, grab a drink, my choice today is black coffee, and join me as we explore the unsolved mystery iceberg. We are on the last few entries of tier 3 out of 11, and so to start off with we have Sergeant Patrick Rust. He was a 24 year old US soldier, found dead just 6 months after disappearing from a bar in New York. This was in 2007 and he had just finished two tours in Iraq and Afghanistan. So while in New York he went out drinking one night and his skeletal remains were found six months later in a field about five miles from the bar. His army dog tags were missing but he still had $80 in his pocket that wasn't taken, meaning that he likely wasn't robbed. There have been no suspects in the case, no determined cause of death, and his case is still open 16 years later. The Sheep Squatch is a white woolly haired creature, reportedly seen across various counties in West Virginia. It is described as being roughly the size of a bear, having four legs, a pointed head, and sharp saber-like teeth. It also has a set of large horns, similar to a goat, incredible claws, and is said to smell of sulfur. There have been numerous sightings over the years since 1994, but the elusive Sheep Squatch has never been captured either on camera or in person. The ship of Theseus is a very, very interesting thought experiment. In the story, Theseus, the mythical founder of Athens, had a great ship, and every year the Athenians would honor Theseus by taking the ship on a pilgrimage to Delos. Over the years, as ships tend to do, it required maintenance and the changing out of parts. The question arose, if you take the ship and replace a few bolts, is it still the same ship? And most people would probably say yes. So then if you also replace a single plank on the deck, would it still be the same ship? Again, most people would probably answer yes. The idea is, if changing one piece at a time keeps it as the same ship, would you still have the same ship if, over the years, one by one you changed out every single part of the ship so that no pieces or parts of the original ship remained? This is a very interesting idea exploring the definitions we put on things. And I've also seen this argument made for stuff like a whirlpool, where you get certain whirlpools that can last for quite a long time, and you could identify them as that whirlpool, even though none of the water or matter in the actual whirlpool is ever the same. The water is constantly flowing in and out of the whirlpool, so what we call the whirlpool isn't based on matter, but is really based on a common or familiar pattern. But it is still interesting nonetheless. The sliver cat is a terrifying creature said to live in North America. America. It is a large 300 pounds cat with tasseled ears and horizontally split red eyes. Its main distinctive feature is its large tail, which is over 3 meters or 11 feet in length. And on the end of the tail is a large bony club that is smooth on one side and spiked on the other side. It is said to hang from tree branches and wait until its next victim walks by. Then it knocks it unconscious with its clubbed tail and uses the the spiked end of its tail to impale its victim, drag it up the tree, and 
eat it at its own leisure. Spix's macaw spotted in the wild. So the Spix's macaw was made famous in the Rio animated film and is a rare blue parrot thought to be extinct in the wild. In 2016, one was spotted flying through the trees in Brazil for the first time in 15 years. Since that sighting, it has never been spotted again or captured and its location, if it does remain alive, is unknown. There is a large colony of Spix's macaw being bred in Qatar and Brazil had plans of reintroducing the Spix's macaw back into the wild, but they hadn't started it yet and so where this solitary macaw came from is still a little uncertain. Stanton Bones. So this is a really odd but interesting one. Dr. Carrie Quillen Stanton owned a private island and was always a unique eccentric man, but after his death in 1987, what they found on the island shocked everyone. Carrie was a doctor who, at just 34 years old in 1957, returned from New York back to California to run his family's ranch on Santa Cruz Island, which his family actually owned 90% of. This was the largest of California's Channel Islands, and his father, who was an oil and businessman, bought the island for $1 million back in 1937. So Carrie moved back, and when his parents died, he took control of the ranch and the island. He was very protective of the island and he was a very particular and eccentric man and one time he was walking along the beaches of the island where he found a trash bag. Inside the trash bag he found amongst other things an envelope with the name and address of a popular yacht lender in Ventura which is about 40 miles away on the mainland. He took the trash bag, went all the way to the offices in Ventura, threw it down on the guy's desk and said excuse me sir I believe you left this on my island. He led a mostly solitary life on the island, but did occasionally welcome visitors. And over the years, he developed a very, very rigid routine that he expected all of his guests to abide by. Dinner was always semi-formal and begun precisely at 7.30 in the evening. The weekly menu never changed. And at exactly 8.30 p.m., him and all of his guests would go to the living room for coffee and dessert. And the only dessert he ever served on the island was oatmeal cookies. Cookies. Then he went to bed at exactly 9 p.m. Carrie strictly followed this routine up until his death in 1987. And in 1990, while searching the island, the agricultural commissioner found a 19th century shed. And inside this shed, he found a tightly sealed copper box. This was very unusual. And when he opened the box, he found cremated human remains. No one on the island knew about this copper box, when the remains were put there, or who they belonged to. They also also found a clothing fastener from the 1940s, as well as several false teeth from the 1950s, and a diamond studded platinum ring from before World War II. The remains were believed to have been from a woman who died in the 1950s or 60s, and it is unknown whether Carrie even knew about this box and the remains, as he was said to be very neat and meticulous, and labelled almost everything on the island. So having a random unlabeled copper box full of human remains seemed a little out of character for him. But maybe he was hiding something. Or maybe it was his parents who were responsible for this. Either way, the identity of this cremated woman remains unknown and it is unlikely that she will ever be identified. Stickdeath.com. So I'll make this one quick as it is technically as of 2022 not unsolved anymore. Stickdeath.com was a website created in 1996 which is super long ago in terms of internet time. It contained various animations and games of stick figures in various situations and stories. It was pretty awesome for the 1990s, but in 2007 the site was closed. When it was closed, a lot of the content that was on the site was essentially lost and deemed as lost media. But as of 2022, every piece of content that was on the site has been located and re-uploaded, so it is no longer lost media. Some of the content they had on there is pretty cool, and it's super nostalgic and reminiscent of the 90s and early 2000s internet if you want to go check it out. The striped jaguar is a cryptid said to live in the rainforests of Peru, Colombia and Ecuador. It is described as being the same size as a jaguar but with white stripes instead of the black dots that it normally has. Its head is slightly more narrow than a jaguar and it has been said to track and kill hunters. Susan Powell was an American woman who went missing in Utah 2009. It is in fact believed that 
that she was killed by her husband, Joshua Powell, but he was never charged for her murder or disappearance, so let me know what you think in the comments below. On December 9th, 2009, Susan went to the morning church service with her two sons, Charles and Brayden, and later that day a neighbour would visit the household and would leave at around 5 in the evening. This neighbour would be the last person outside of the family to see Susan alive. So the next day, when neither Josh nor Susan showed up to work, and when the two boys hadn't been dropped off at their daycare, the family's relatives reported the entire family missing. Police initially did a search and ended up actually breaking into the house, as they suspected that the entire family had maybe died of carbon monoxide poisoning. When they entered the house, however, they didn't find any of the family. But what they did notice was two fans turned up to full blast, pointing at a single damp spot on the couch. Susan's purse, wallet and ID were all found in the house, so her having run away seems a lot less likely. And her cell phone was later found in the family's vehicle, so they had no idea where the family had gone. Until around 5 in the evening that day, Joshua returned home with the two boys and was obviously taken into questioning. He said that he had left to go on a camping trip with the two boys just after midnight, and he left Susan sleeping at home. The police were unable to find or locate the campsite that Joshua said they'd gone to, and they thought it was very, very weird that Joshua had taken the two boys out camping after midnight in cold, blizzard-like conditions when they were due to be in daycare just a few hours later. And Joshua hadn't told his boss that he wasn't going to be in that day because he told the police that he thought it was a Sunday instead of a Monday. So all of this is already starting to sound a little bit suspicious. And a few days later, investigators found traces of Susan's blood on the floor of the family home. They found various life insurance policies taken out for Susan, amounting to roughly $1.5 million, and a handwritten letter from Susan expressing fear for her life. Joshua, even since he was a kid, was known to have killed one of his sister's gerbils and to have threatened his mum with a butcher knife. So yeah, not the most grounded of individuals. Joshua later liquidated Susan's retirement accounts. He took his kids out of daycare and there was evidence that he had previously spoken to co-workers regarding how one would hide a body in one of the abandoned mine shafts in the western Utah desert. So this was not looking good for Joshua and later his son Charlie did confirm that they had gone on a camping trip as Joshua said. He said that his mother Susan had gone with them but she didn't return. Weeks later the two boys reportedly claimed that their mother was dead and one of them drew a picture of a van with three people in the front of it and then told the carers that mummy was in the trunk. This case goes very deep into stuff like Joshua's dad Stephen who was abusive to Joshua and his siblings as a kid. Stephen being arrested for possessing thousands of photos of underaged girls and even of Susan herself all of which were taken secretly and without their knowledge. Joshua fought multiple lawsuits against the police in regards to his involvement in the disappearance and potential murder and there was a website that was made purporting to fully explain Susan's life and situation but the website actually subtly said that Susan was crazy, manipulative and probably ran off with another man, abandoning her family. The website and posts were thought to have been made by Joshua and his brother. So after all of this, Joshua was deemed unfit to take care of his kids and custody of the boys was given to Susan's parents. And one time after the boys were brought to Joshua's house for a supervised visit, Joshua grabbed and pulled the two boys inside, shut the door on the social worker and soon after this the house exploded, killing Joshua and the two boys. The boys had axe wounds on their heads and necks and there were two five gallon cans of gasoline found on the premises. So it is thought that Joshua lit the house on fire, picked up the axe and attacked his two boys before being overwhelmed by the smoke and fire. It is thought that Joshua's brother Michael had at least knowledge of what Joshua did and at most was an accomplice in these murders. And roughly one year after the explosion, Michael died after jumping from the roof of a parking garage. So this one was incredibly disturbing and heartbreaking, as it always is when kids are involved. It seems, at least to me, like a pretty open and shut case. But because Joshua and Michael were both cowards, Susan's family never got justice for their daughter and her two boys were sadly
deadly, monstrously taken out of this world by their own father. Synchronicity is a concept in psychology first introduced by Carl G. Jung. It describes circumstances that appear meaningfully connected, yet lack a causal connection. Like for instance when you learn a word that you've never seen before, and then notice it in a book that you are reading the very same day. Or when you are thinking about someone and then receive a phone call from that person. Jung was a fantastic psychologist, and while the idea of synchronicity is purely hypothetical and not strictly scientific, he felt that it was relevant enough to warrant its own concept, even if he never fully proved it. There have been several refined definitions over the years, such as a meaningful coincidence of two or more events, where something other than the probability of chance is involved. And while you have ideas like the placebo effect, where the placebo doesn't strictly actually do anything, but if the person thinks the placebo is doing something, then it does actually have physical implications. Two thirds of therapists actually believe that synchronicity experiences could be useful for therapy. So if you're a fan of Jung or psychology, definitely check this one out. The Texacana Moonlight Murders. This was a series of five unsolved murders and violent crimes committed in and around Arkansas and Texas in 1946. These were attributed to the killer known as the Phantom of Texacana or simply the Phantom Killer or Phantom Slayer. The killer mostly targeted couples, and the first three attacks were on lovers' lanes, or quiet areas and roads that couples would park up on in order to make out. The fourth attack was in a farmhouse in Arkansas, and after this, the whole of Texacana went into panic mode. Shops were selling out of guns, ammo, and locks, and some people even tried to bait out the killer, going to these lovers' lanes, parking up, and just waiting there with a loaded gun. But the killer never struck again. Of the four couples that he attacked, five of the victims sadly died, and the prime suspect was a man called Yul Sweeney, who was a petty career criminal who was linked to the murders through statements that his wife made as well as through circumstantial evidence. But when his wife decided not to testify against him, the prosecutors decided not to press for murder charges, as the evidence for the case just wasn't there. Sweeney was given quite a long sentence for other unrelated crimes, but to this day, nobody has served time for these killings. The Cure for Insomnia is an 87 hour long film created by John Henry Timmis IV. It was recognized by the Guinness World Records as the longest film ever created. So subscribe and leave a like down below guys, and if we get 500 likes, I will do an 87 hour long episode. The film consisted of actor L.D. Groban reading a 4,080 page poem titled A cure for insomnia. This was spliced with heavy metal music and adult content, if you know what I mean. The idea of the film was to cure insomniacs by reprogramming their biological clock, and it was shown at the School of the Art Institute in Chicago from January 31st to February the 3rd, and was otherwise never released, with all copies of the film believed to have been lost. Maybe they did truly stumble across the cure for insomnia, and the whole film and operation was shut down by Big Pharma. It's a theory. The Television Ghost was an early television program broadcast in New York City in the early 1930s. The show centered on the idea of ghosts telling stories of how they were killed. Each episode featured a different story and a different ghost, but the ghost was always played by the same actor, George Kelting, who was dressed up roughly the same every time, with a white painted face and a sheet wrapped around him. This wasn't incredibly advanced as it was the 19th and it was kind of closer to a radio show, with the video footage of Kelting being mostly a static shot of his head and shoulders as he was telling the stories. Each episode was 15 minutes long and it ran for two years before being stopped in 1933. It is often thought to be the first dramatic television anthology or series ever released, but because it was made so early, no footage of it is thought to have survived. The Younger Lady is the unofficial name of a mummy found in the Valley of the Kings in 1898. There was some speculation as to her identity when she was first found, but through DNA tests, she was shown to be the daughter of the Pharaoh Amenhotep III, a sister and wife to the Pharaoh Akhenaten, and the mother of the Pharaoh Tutankhamun. Despite all of these connections, she doesn't seem to have been a prominent figure in her own lifetime. It is thought that she was likely killed
killed by a blunt force hit to the face. But whether this was from something like a chariot accident, or a kick in the face from a horse, or whether it was intentional through something like a axe or hammer attack, remains to this day a mystery. The unknown great train robbers. So the great train robbery was quite a famous event, where in 1963, 15 men robbed a Royal Mail train heading from Glasgow to London. They stole 2.6 million pounds in cash, which today is the equivalent of around 61 million pounds. After the robbery, the gang hid out on a farm, which the police later found, along with a bunch of incriminating evidence, like a game of Monopoly that they were apparently playing, along with fingerprints of all of the robbers. They were eventually arrested and the ringleaders were given a sentence of 30 years. But most of the money stolen was actually never recovered. And after everyone was arrested, there were still three or four robbers that were never identified, and so were never convicted for the robbery. Their identity to this day remains a mystery, and though they are probably dead by now as this was in the 1960s, they likely made off with a lot of money. Unusual Doctor Who episode recoveries. So Doctor Who, for those who don't know, is a long-running sci-fi TV series in the UK that first aired in 1963 and is in fact still running to this day. It was the inspiration for Inspector Spacetime for any community fans out there. And between 1967 and 1974, the BBC would regularly wipe and delete old tapes in order to save money by reusing them for new content. And a lot of the tapes that were wiped were Doctor Who episodes. They later stopped wiping tapes and decided to archive them all. But for the first six seasons, there are 97 episodes that have never been fully recovered, with only small clips and audio from the episodes surviving. It is possible that these episodes might be recovered, but it is thought very unlikely, and the odds are that these 97 episodes will forever remain lost media. The Will of the Wisp is a phenomenon in European folklore that resembles a flickering lamp or lantern, and is said to mislead travelers into sometimes dangerous situations. It goes by a few names depending on where you're from. Will-O-Wisp, Ignis Fatuus, which is Latin for Foolish Flame, Jack-O-Lantern, Friar's Lantern, or my personal favourite, the Hinky Punk. Similar phenomena has been noted all over the world, like the St. Louis Light in Saskatchewan, the Spook Light in Missouri, the Marfa Light in Texas, the Naga Fireballs in Thailand, and the Hestdalen Light in Norway. But in the European folklore, both Will and Jack actually just refer to the names Will and Jack, with a lantern obviously being a light and a wisp being a lit kindling of sorts. And one Irish version of the tale involves a ne'er-do-well called Drunk or Stingy Jack. So in the story, the devil comes to collect Jack's soul. Jack agrees, but tricks the devil into turning himself into a coin so that he can buy one last drink before he goes. So the devil turns himself into a coin, but Jack just places him in his pocket next to a crucifix, which stops the devil from turning back into his original form. So in exchange for his freedom, the devil grants Jack 10 more years. Then when the devil returns to take Jack's soul, Jack once again tricks him into climbing up a tree. Then he carves a crucifix below the tree, preventing the devil from coming down from the tree. So in exchange for the devil's freedom this time, the devil agrees not to pursue Jack. When Jack does eventually die, he is not allowed into heaven and when he goes down to hell, the devil won't let him in there either. I guess he was just bitter from being tricked so often, but he does give Jack a flame from the fires of hell. As Jack can neither go to heaven or hell, he is forced to walk the earth forever, and so uses this flame to guide his way. So he takes this ember and places it into a carved out turnip, which was what they originally used before pumpkins, and this served as a lantern to guide his way. And so that is how Jack o' lanterns were were born. The Yuba County Five is a case that I could and might consider doing a full video on. This was regarding the deaths and disappearance of five young men in California 1978. They each had mild intellectual and learning disabilities, and after attending a basketball game and stopping by a store to purchase sodas and snacks, the group was never seen alive again. After not returning home the following day, the parents of some of the men reported them missing. Initially, they didn't really have much to go on, but soon the car that they were travelling in was spotted over 7 
20 miles away, abandoned on a mountainous trail in a forest. The location was very odd as the men were all fairly lightly dressed and nobody could really figure out why the men would travel up this long winding mountainous road in the middle of a winter night. Inside the car were empty cartons and wrappers from what the men had purchased in the store, but the men themselves were nowhere to be found. There was evidence to suggest that the car had been lightly stuck in the snow, but experts said that the snow wouldn't have been deep enough, that they couldn't have just pushed the car free. The car was otherwise in perfect working condition, and when police hotwired the car, it started up immediately and still had plenty of gas left in the tank. When the car was taken in for inspection, the mystery just got even deeper. The underside of the car had no scratches or bumps or gouges, despite driving a long distance up this difficult bumpy mountain path. This meant that either the driver was extremely careful or had extensive knowledge and experience of the surrounding area and maybe of this particular road and was able to maneuver through it without damaging the car. And the driver that night, one of the five men, was not known to have this knowledge or skill. On top of that, the car was also left unlocked with the window rolled down. Two of the men were found dead in the snow, 11 miles from the car, and later on another two were found dead either in or around a trailer that was maintained by the United States Forest Service. There are so many details in this case, which is why I might do a full video on this later on if anyone wants to see it, but the man inside the trailer, Ted Weyer, had lost about 45 kilos and had a long beard, suggesting that he had been alive in the trailer after his disappearance for about three months. This trailer was actually partly designed for emergencies, and so it was heavily supplied with almost everything that you would need to survive. There was enough food in the trailer to feed all five of the men for over a year that was completely untouched. There were plenty of matches and fuel in the trailer, and gas to heat the trailer, and none of these were used. And there were heavy winter clothes inside the trailer that again weren't even touched. This whole thing is incredibly strange, considering they didn't die immediately, surviving for at least a month or two, and everyone that did die either died of hypothermia or starvation, when there were plenty of readily available resources to fix both of these issues. The fifth man in the group, Matthias, was never found, and to this day his fate and whereabouts remain unknown. There are so many questions and details regarding this case, and if anyone wants to see it, I promise to cover the entire case in detail in a future video. The zip gun bomber was an unidentified figure who, beginning in 1982, began terrorizing New York citizens by mailing booby-trapped packages to various people. The first package was sent to 54-year-old high school counselor, Joan Betty Kipp. She received a cookbook in the mail, and when she opened it, she was shot by a gun inside of the cookbook, and she unfortunately died hours later. Then, a whole 10 years later, four more packages were sent out to various residents of New York, one containing a medallion, which, when opened, shot and hit the recipient and two of his relatives. Thankfully, none of the people hit actually died. Then, 75-year-old Alice Caswell was shot by a similar package containing a medallion. Then, 18-year-old Stephanie Gaffner, who was actually eight months pregnant at the time, opened a package containing a book and was hit by shrapnel of three bullets. Thankfully, both her and the baby survived, and she gave birth to a healthy girl just a few months later. The last attack was on 77-year-old Richard Bazile, who opened a parcel containing a video cassette, which then exploded. He wasn't hit or injured by the attack, thankfully, and police weren't ever really able to determine whether the attacks were targeted or were just completely random. There were a few suspects for the attacks, one of whom being the first victim, Jones, husband, but to this day, the identity of the zip gun killer remains a mystery. Mr. Krull is the name given to an unidentified serial child assaulter who attacked three girls in Australia in the 1980s and 90s, and is the prime suspect for a 1991 abduction and murder of a fourth girl. The police describe him as highly intelligent, as he meticulously and carefully planned each of his attacks, cutting phone lines, conducting surveillance on his victims and their families. He ensured that he left zero forensic evidence or traces, 
years. He covered his face fully at all times, left multiple red herrings or fake clues for the police, and he was threatening but soft-spoken and calm during his attacks. His MO was to stalk out these houses, cut the phone lines, break in in the middle of the night, tie up or incapacitate the parents, and then assault or kidnap the girls. There is more than a million dollars reward for information leading to the capture and arrest of this man, but as of today he has not been identified or captured. And that is all we have time for. I really hope you enjoyed exploring this third tier of the Unsolved Mystery Iceberg with me. Feel free to check out each episode as they're released. And if you'd like to watch every mystery covered so far, I have the full playlist down in the description below, ready for you to binge or fall asleep to. And as always, thanks for watching.